Well, hello, 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 everybody. Hope everybody is doing well tonight. Uh, here we are with our uh, installment of Canoe Hound Adventures live show. And let me just uh, kill some sound here, people. There we go. First glitch out of the way. Hope everybody's doing well tonight. Uh, we got a good show ahead of us tonight. For sure, we've got uh, a special guest on tonight. This is basically... We'll, we'll call it, we'll call it the kickoff to this uh, this show and the whole uh, interview uh, format that we're going to be starting up with. Um, we've done a couple of test episodes, but this one here is the uh, the first episode where I've actually uh, recruited a uh, a guest. And uh, thank you, Martin. And uh, yeah, essentially we're uh, we're going to have ourselves a good time tonight, and we're going to uh, to get some questions answered, and we're uh, going to you know share some stories and uh, just chill, relax, and have a good time. I'll just let you guys know uh, kind of what the itinerary is going to be like, and it'll be the same for, I believe, most of the shows that we're going to be producing from here on. Uh, formats could change, though, over time. Uh, essentially, what we're going to do is, uh, for about the first 10 minutes there, I'm just going to give you some updates on the website or on, the, uh, on my YouTube channel and other things of that sort. And uh, we'll, uh, you know, just updates, things that are happening with us. Uh, at about 7.10, 7.15, now uh, we'll introduce our guest, and we'll have him on panel for about uh, 45 minutes, where we'll discuss all kinds of things that uh, are going on between his channels and our channels, and uh, we'll also take questions from yourselves. Uh, if you have questions of our guest that's going to be on panel, please do uh, put it in the chat, and I will uh, do my darndest to get it up there so that uh, everybody can actually, uh, you know, get to find out the things and get to know and, you know, answer the questions that you might have of our guests, uh, you know, today and in the future as well. Uh, about eight o'clock is when we're going to be doing our Canoe Hound Adventure swag giveaway. Uh, that's something that's uh, been very well received. Of course, everybody likes free stuff. And then after we do that there, we'll be opening up the, uh, the panel here. Uh, we'll, we'll invite a few guests on uh, to join in on the chat and we'll just have some general conversation, whether it's with the uh, the guest of the week or, you know, just between ourselves. And, uh, yeah. And then we'll try and wrap things up, of course, by 9 o'clock. Uh, that there is always a tough one because of late we've been having some great conversations. And everybody has uh, just been enjoying themselves. And, you know, the two-hour live stream turns into a two and a half, three, four. And we even had a five-hour one there a couple weeks back. So, but that's a little late for me. Uh, I have commitments after the show. So, I'll have to try and wrap it up by then. So, just starting off generally, uh, I have to do this. This here is, is a very special day for my mother. Uh, it's my mom's birthday. I just want to wish my mother a very, very merry, a very happy birthday. I love you. Uh, the whole family loves you. And uh, hope you're having a good time at the casino tonight. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Canoe Hound Adventures uh, hit, a, hit a small milestone uh, this week. We, uh, we finally surpassed the 1,100 subscriber marks thanks to people like you. Uh, the support, support that you guys are showing, is it's, it's amazing. I, I truly appreciate it. I love it when everybody uh, watches my videos and especially when you leave comments. Uh, I try my hardest to answer or, or comment back uh, just to show my appreciation. I think everybody's comment deserves a... Uh, a comment back or some sort of acknowledgement and I do my darndest to get back to you and like I say show the love back so that's all cool stuff too uh, if you haven't already done so uh, please do subscribe to the channel it really helps us out uh, it really will help with uh, getting great guests onto the show so that you guys can enjoy your your experience and help me grow as a YouTube creator and you know get me out of my shell. I'm not the best public speaker. I'm trying my darndest here. And that's why I'm always tripping over my tongue. But uh, by doing this constantly, it certainly will help out the uh, the live streams and get things going really, really well here. So, and just as a, a reminder, we are live every Tuesday, 7 p.m. And uh, from 7 till about 9. And like I say, I'm very excited. I'm already very excited. Um, this show is uh, is really kind of taken off. I've uh, I've been speaking to some great YouTube content creators, 
And we're not talking just uh, local people. We're talking, I've actually uh, got people interested from a few different places, uh, from down in the U.S. I've got somebody who's going to be on the show in the, in the upcoming weeks, uh, somebody from over in Sweden that's going to be on the show in the upcoming weeks, and a couple of uh, larger YouTubers in the area that um, will really add some value to the show. Uh, tonight's guest is a great YouTuber, very, very knowledgeable. Uh, if you have questions for him, pick his brain because this guy's got answers for a lot of different things for sure. And let's see here. Oh, one more thing. I finally, finally, finally had the opportunity to get out to my day camp. Uh, for those of you that do follow me on a regular basis, um, I am a, an avid canoeist. I am a bush crafter or bush crafter by the sense. Uh, I, I actually shouldn't say I'm a bush crafter. I, I have bush crafting skills. Um, and I have a day camp that uh, on a piece of property that was allotted to me by the by the uh, property owner. He gave me permission to use it. And I hadn't been there since April of this year, uh, just because it was a very busy summer. That was a good thing because I was up north canoeing quite a bit. And um, I took Molly out on, uh, what was it, Sunday? Yeah, it was on Sunday. And we shot ourselves actually three different videos. I did the, uh, the day camp video, and then I shot a couple of review videos, which will be uh, coming up here in within the next week or so. But uh, tomorrow morning, 8 a.m., mark your calendars. Uh, I will be uh, posting the uh, the day of the day camp. Uh, and I'll give you a little teaser. There is a canoe hound fail, <laughs> fail on there. So uh, get on there and uh, please do leave me some comments. Yeah, that's awesome. So I see uh, this chat is really starting to fill up here. Um, let's see here, let's uh, welcome a few people. I'm just going to go through uh who we got here we got uh we got avid outdoorsy guy we have ashley's in the house how you doing ashley good to see you we got therese from lady t survival uh we have our guest is in here on the chat already there martin i hope you're all ready for a great night uh marie johns hi thank you for coming by we have our good friend uncle stye from stye north dave from beastly iron works uh let's see we got uh is actually showing me we got like 18 or 19 people daniel uh, millot thank you for coming in as well and for those of you that uh, are new and have maybe come over from martin's channel through his promotion and i must say martin did an awesome <laughs> an awesome uh announcement video that he posted on his site uh Man, I'm surprised you went to such great lengths, Martin, to uh, to actually <laughs> do that video. If you watch the intro video, you can go back after the show here, check it out, because uh, you will get seasick like I did. Not really, but uh, he was out there, and it was a little windy, and he was uh, he was rocking, but he rocked off a great intro. So thanks very much. I appreciate that. We have uh, Full Armor Bassing is in the house. Uh, let's see who else we got here. Well, we do have John's Life is in the house, too. Thanks for popping in, guys. Like I say, I, I appreciate every one of you popping in. Outdoor Dauber, there's a regular uh, regular fellow. Uh, Brian J. Yeah, that's all cool stuff. So I'm just going to uh, move on to the next step here. Like I say, I've got a, an itinerary, but uh, it's going to be me reading. So if you see me poking my nose off to the side, I would like to uh, introduce to you my guest this week. Uh, Martin Pine from the YouTube channel, Pine Martin. Uh, Martin's a Canadian outdoorsman with many years of canoeing experience in Ontario. He has a vast knowledge of the outdoors, has many tricks and tips uh, and techniques that uh, he's learned over the years. This guy has a lot of experience. Uh, Martin's popular YouTube channel has well over 8,000 subscribers and covers everything from food diet and dehydrating for trips, uh, adventures, canoe trips, educational videos, and with his experience, uh, Martin has been a speaker at the uh, Ontario Winter Camping Symposium. And I believe that was in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Martin Pine. How are you doing, Martin? Hi, good evening. Thank you very much. That was a very, very generous introduction. I oh, appreciate geez, it. Man. That's the least I can do, man. You've been, uh, you've been awesome throughout this whole process with me trying to learn all this stuff and uh, trying to get... Uh, trying to get a real grasp on what I think is a great concept for a, uh, a YouTube um, live show, I guess you'd call it, right? 
Yeah, I, I was, well, first of all, I was enormously gratified to be invited for this. I, I feel very honored by this. I mean, I've, you know, you, you set up a big channel. I have a tiny channel, 8,000 subscribers. It's, it's, it's pretty small when you've been uh, making YouTube videos as long as I have um, since about 2012 or something like that. So it's, it's not exactly phenomenal growth. Um, uh, and nevertheless, I, I, I'm very flattered that you, you invited me. And I, I actually love this idea of having a live stream devoted to this because I participate in live streams on other subjects, you know, politics and religion and philosophy and you know all kinds of other discussions and stuff like that this is the first time i've ever stumbled upon a a live stream of this sort devoted to people uh, in the um the outdoor camping canoeing bushcraft community so i was just tickled when i uh heard about this so yeah of course i was happy to promote it and make a little video for it i, I i'm flattered i really appreciate it um i'm grateful to everyone who's, who's decided to tune in i wish i could have lured more people in unfortunately my um my channel I don't produce a, a lot of content. I, I don't produce frequently or regularly. And as a result, um, uh, the viewers come to my videos some, sometimes very late. And it takes a long time for people, it's a significant number of people to, to find my videos. Um, so I, I, I would have loved if like, you know, a thousand people would have seen my video and flooded. I would have loved that. <laughs> but, but that's not the kind of channel I have. <laughs> and it's not the kind of following that I have. Uh, but I'm grateful to any viewers who uh, saw the video and, and decided to, to tune in. And by the way, congratulations on that milestone that you, you just passed. Through. That's that's nice. I, I remember what it's like to break over a thousand videos, a thousand um, subscribers, and yeah, each one yeah. of those is a real, a real feather in the cap. So congrats. Well, thank you. And, and you know what? Like yourself, it's uh, it's taken me a little while to get here too. I uh, I revamp my uh, my YouTube channel back around December. Well, between Christmas and New Year's, actually. And uh, it's been trudging along, and I think it's been showing the proper type of growth. I've been trying to grow the channel the way I think YouTube wants us to try and grow our channels. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, with that being said, it's uh, I'm, I'm happy with the progress. And th this whole thing isn't really to, to try and build my subscribership, although it would be nice. Um, but you know what? The, the whole thing is, is uh, there's a lot of outdoorsmen out there, whether, you know, whether they're canoers or... Uh, Bush crafters, and I, I have many, many hobbies. I fish, and you know, I don't hunt. That's the one thing I don't do. But you know, there, there's so many facets of what I do, and with my adventures, and my name is kind of deceiving, canoe hound, right? But that's just a nickname that I had, I've had for many years now. But uh, you know, so I want to try and get this channel to showcase all these different things. Uh, within the next couple of weeks, I've actually got a guest coming on that's going to be. Uh, uh, He's more of a bush crafter than he is like, you know, a paddler or anything like that. So I'm quite excited to have him on. I won't announce his name until we have a, actually have a, a date set and, and, you know, firmed up. But uh, yeah. So Martin, tell us, tell, tell the viewers and myself uh, a little bit about yourself. Like what's your background? Uh, my background. Well, uh, I'm Canadian. Uh, I grew up in rural Quebec. I now live in Ontario. Um, and uh, my YouTube channel is just a labor of love. It's um uh, my, there's no money in it for me. Um, I never monetize my videos or anything like that. Um, and uh, I've never tried sort of to aggressively grow it or anything like that. It's just a labor of love. Um, I love camping and canoeing and bushcraft and all of those kinds of things and snowshoeing and winter camping. And I just loved watching people make content of that sort. And I always wondered if I could. Uh, and so I decided to try my hand um, at it and I found that I enjoy it and the enjoyment I get out of it is sort of out of entirely out of proportion with anything I get out of it uh, because I'm not getting any money out of it or anything like that or big accolades or anything like that, nor do I expect any. But uh, that, that's sort of um, you know, my background with respect to YouTube. Uh, my personal background, I, as I said, I grew up in rural Quebec. Uh, I moved to uh, Montreal as a young adult. I went to university. I studied uh, at a liberal arts college, um, and then I went on to grad school in philosophy. Um, I retired early um, uh, from a career in the, in the tech field um, in 2005 at the age of 40, and my wife and I uh, had discovered canoe tripping uh, when I was in my late, when actually my mid-30s. Um, she had done it once before when she was a teenager. And we decided we wanted to organize our, our lives around uh, spending as much time outdoors as uh, we wanted. And so that's what we did. Uh, we set about uh, uh, our, our jobs and our, our paths and our investments and, and so forth to, to get away from the, the rat race and the nine to five kind of 
uh, grind. We sold our house, um, uh, we sold our car, we sold all our furnishings. We bought a pickup truck and a used Airstream travel trailer. And we literally traveled around North America um, in that, living in, in that Airstream trailer um, 24 seven for four and a half years. And uh, we, we, we camped all over the United States uh, that, that we could. And, and whenever we'd come back to Canada, we'd come back to Ontario and we would always come back to Muskoka because that, that is the hotspot in Ontario for canoe tripping. And so we organized our lives uh, around that for a number of years. And then uh, we decided to settle in, in Muskoka where we live now. And um, yeah, that's sort of the, the background. Uh, I, I should maybe say something about my childhood. In, living in rural Quebec, there was a lot of time spent uh, outside. Um, we didn't call it bushcraft or anything like that. We called it playing outside. So there was a lot of hiking and camping and snowshoeing and building Quincy's and camping in winter and stuff like that and fishing and all that stuff. It was just playing outside. So that stuff was sort of pickled into me very, very early just from you know growing up where I did and, and the people around me um, having some, some knowledge of that kind of stuff. Uh, so that is my background in it. Awesome. See, uh, somebody here obviously that's following you, the Wild Yam. Uh, you've influenced a lot of people, Martin, including including me. Uh, you introduced me to Crown Land Camping. We will touch on that in a little while, of course. Uh, so basically, with what you're saying there, like, what what inspires you to do what you do? Like, uh, you you've actually actually made a, a huge move to you know to sell to sell the farm, so to say. And, and to, to live this life, uh, you and your wife, it's, uh, you know, many people dream of doing this. What inspired you to actually, you know, get right on that and do it? Um, let's see. Well, it's kind of, a, I, I've been thinking about, you, you, you told me you were going to ask me this ahead of time. And I, 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 <laughs> Sorry, I, I have, it, and it, it, it didn't help. It actually just filled my head with, uh, with, with too many thoughts. Um, well, first of all, uh, my love of the outdoors just comes from growing up where I did in rural Quebec. We just spent a lot of time outdoors. I mean, literally the backyard was just forest. It was woods. And the front yard was the Ottawa River. I, I literally lived on the, the shore of the Ottawa River uh, for much of the year. Uh, part of my, my time was spent in a suburban, um, a suburban of Montreal, an area called Laval. Um, but so much of my early life was spent there that that, that just left a a, an impression on me. It just stayed with me. Uh, a, a love of walking in the woods and being in the woods and being at ease in the woods and, and all of that. I just, I just loved it. So I, the passion comes just from early childhood exposure um, all the way through my, my adolescence. It's, it now resonates with me. I am most comfortable in the Canadian woods um, of the sort that we have around here, for instance. Uh, unfortunately, I, I discovered canoeing very late in life and that was a weird a weird thing that was a that was the real passion that sort of drove us to organize our lives differently my wife and i throughout our 20s had spent a lot of time uh camping whenever we could we were both university students so we couldn't get away and we were dirt poor and eating over a sink we didn't have a car or anything like that but when we could we would during the summers when we could we would go on these extended camping trips so we went to the grand canyon and we went to the painted desert and we, we you know went to some exotic places um olympic uh, National Park in, in Washington and, and stuff like that. It took some nice long um, weeks and weeks uh, at a time camping out there, but that was all backpacking. But I had never been canoeing, but my wife had been on a canoe trip when she was about 16 with a boyfriend and a couple of friends. And one day we were on a day hike, we were into bird watching, and we were at Pinery Provincial Park in Ontario. I think that's up near the shores of Lake Huron, if I remember. Beautiful. And, yeah, and we were walking around there one day, and there's like this man-made canal that runs through it and there were some uh canoes for rent there that you could rent so you could just paddle up and down the canal and on a hunch i just said just on a whim i just said eh, why don't we rent one you know it was like 20 bucks for an hour or something like that so that's what we did i didn't know how to paddle my wife insisted she knew how to paddle so she took the stern because that's where you steer from i got in the bow and we could not make our way along the canal. We just bounced from one bank to the other, back and forth, back and forth. And uh, we did that thing that all couples do when they first get into a canoe. Yeah, we yeah, squabbled yeah. endlessly. But then at some point we switched roles. I had a, I had an intuition about ruddering. I didn't know how to paddle. I didn't know the J-stroke or anything like that. But within, I don't know, 20 minutes, I started out, I went from ruddering in, in, in the stern while she powered us forward uh, in the bow to figuring out the goon stroke or the stern pride. Uh, and I never would have figured out the, the J-stroke on my own. Um, but 
in about 90 minutes of, of, that, of that, that one time that we went out, just on the way out and on the way back to, to returning the canoe, I so fell in love with it. I literally said to my wife on the way back, we have to buy one of these. It was just love at first paddle. I just absolutely love canoeing. I love the silence. I love the, the effortlessness of the, of, the, of the movement. I love how responsive it was. I, knew, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that every little thing I was doing was causing the boat to respond in a, in a way that would be predictable if I understood it better. And we were happening upon wildlife, you know, uh, we were able to sneak up on it and we were birders. So we, this was just wonderful seeing all this, all this bird life from, from the vantage point of the water. So it was terrific. And we immediately fell in love with it. I insisted that we buy a canoe and that's what we did. We, when we got back to London, Ontario, where we lived at the time, I went to Nova Craft Canoe. I asked to test paddle a couple of, of, of canoes. And then I just said, build me a canoe. I plunked down some money and bought it. And after that, we were canoe tripping every weekend that we could. Um, and then we decided this is not enough. We need to spend more time doing this. And that's why we started. That was my wife's idea. She said, let's, let's try to retire early. Let's, let's do more of this. So that, that, that was the inspiration. It was just the, the contact with nature and the contact with, with this vessel, the canoe. So that, that, that leads us into basically the next question I was going to ask you. Obviously, you do a lot of paddling with your wife. Uh, she seems to, from the videos I've seen that you have on your channel, she seems to be a huge part of that. Uh, what, what's, it, what's it like, you know, being on trips all the time with your wife and stuff like that? Like, obviously, you must love it because otherwise you would <laughs> wait her along, right? <laughs> yeah, well, obviously, I love my wife. Uh, she's um, not just my wife. She's my absolute best friend. Uh, and I didn't really appreciate what a good paddler she was and what a good camper she was until I started um, uh, paddling with other people at, on day trips and stuff like that and the occasional camping trip and camping with other people. And I never really appreciated uh, how excellent she was, um, how, how knowledgeable she is and how effortlessly she does things and how, because we've been doing it for so long, how we have our assigned roles. You know, as soon as we, you know, that canoe, you know, uh, it's the, hits the beach and we get out and we, we start scoping out a place to, to set up a you know a, a tent and a tarp and all this stuff we have our our respective roles it's all intuitive and it's just it's like a dance it's, it's a great partnership um and uh she is, is not the type that gets um easily frustrated she's endlessly patient uh we squabble when we're we're paddling and stuff like that sometimes and wind, wind conditions and it's difficult like like anybody would but she's endlessly patient. She's incredible. She's an incredible cook. She, she does all the food preparation. So she's kind of an ideal canoeing partner uh, and camping partner. Uh, I'm totally at ease. There's never any cabin fever. We, we recently spent 11 days, uh, about half of which was spent uh, stuck under a tarp, <laughs> pinned down by heavy wind and rain. And we never had uh, like a, a moment of strife or impatience with one another. It was, it was just fantastic. So the, the reason I like tripping with her is she's really good at it and we get along and honestly I don't know of a more romantic vacation that I can take with my wife you know a trip to Italy or somewhere Paris or something like that would not do it right it, mm -hmm. but an extended period of time in the bush where we are together every minute of the day and night that's that's the most romantic uh vacation I know of so that that's why I do it so. sure my, my wife and I were like that too we're, we're best friends but I have a hard time getting her on a canoe trip oh for a day paddle yes <laughs> on a trip uh because we had a she had a bad experience years ago when we did the Montreal uh, or not what was it the uh the Maple Mountain Loop up in Tomogamy oh, okay and we run into some really bad weather we had our children with us and stuff and since mm -hmm. then she's been a little skittish on it so and I can't blame her because we did have a pretty scary experience, but that's that's for another week. <laughs> it's funny but, you should say she she's okay with day trips and not, not canoe trips. I cannot get my wife out on a day trip. I, it's a struggle. Is that right? on, that's just yeah. I I because of where I live. I live in Muskoka. I live right on the shores of the Muskoka River, and I have a little solo boat. I bought that solo boat because I like to go paddling just on day trips, and so I I bought that boat a couple of summers ago, uh, just so that I could. Uh, get my fill of day tripping and so some people jog in the morning every day that's nice um, uh, Where I'm free and the weather permits I take my boat and I just you know Wheel it through town on my little canoe cart and I just put in and I go paddling every day Which is how I made that uh, promo video for the, for this uh, live stream is that was just part of my my morning routine is going paddling out there Right, uh, but I cannot get her to go on it on day trip for her. It's got to be a canoe trip. It's got to be a camping trip 
Yeah. Well, you know what? You're, you're fortunate that you actually have that like right outside your back door, because I'll tell you, I, I'd love to get out on a daily paddle myself. Closest thing I'd have around here is maybe like the Welland River or uh, the old Welland Canal, which is a recreational canal now. But what's the city at the center of town, right? So, yeah, geez, that's that's cool. If anybody in the uh, in the live chat has any questions for uh, for Martin, please do put them on. I, I'll gladly put them on the uh, on the screen here, and uh, we'll we'll cover those things as well. I see we got a lot of new people in here right now, too. We got the Wild Yam. We got uh, Jess over at Rain Dance Bushcraft, uh, Winging It with Irish Colleen and Retired Outside, Bridgetop Survival. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate you popping in tonight. This is our guest tonight, uh, Martin Pine from the uh, YouTube channel Pine Martin. Notice the way uh, Martin is spelled. Uh, it's not M-A-R-T-I-N, but Y-N. So when you go check out his channel, you want to make sure you get the right, uh, right one in there. Please do check out his channel. As I mentioned, if anybody has any questions, please do put them on the screen. Uh, let's see here. So that gets us to, where are we here? I got my cheat sheet here. I think you got a copy of that too, right? <laughs> I do, I do. Yeah, so uh, what's your fondest memory of or experience on a canoe trip? Okay, well, that's another one I sort of agonized over. Uh, in fact, I had to discuss that one with, with, my, with my wife. Uh, so there's kind of two conflicting answers here. Um, so fondest memories. Well, we've taken some exotic trips. Um, uh, the most exotic things were like going to the Grand Canyon or camping in the Painted Desert, um, in Petrified Forest National Park, and in Big Bend in, in Texas. That was all desert camping. It, it's that it was alien to our sensibilities. It was something that we didn't know about. We had to read up on it and study it and study the specific areas we were going. And we were backpacking, and you can't carry a lot of water, and so there was just the logistics of, of desert camping are completely uh, uh, different. So it posed all kinds of challenges, and I loved it. It was unforgettable unforgettable so I, uh, I I can I can never forget those trips but those are backpacking trips um, uh, uh, Florida Everglades uh, we did a, a lot of uh, canoeing down there uh, and paddling through mangrove swamps uh, and, and forests that was amazing paddling with gators and crocodiles um, I have some funny stories about about that I could tell you on sometime when we have more time um, so those are extremely memorable. Um, another sort of canoe related one that's really memorable, uh, a memory, it's not exactly a camping trip, uh, but it, it's almost a camping trip. Uh, we took a white water course at the Madawaska Canoe Center, which I can recommend to anyone if you're interested in uh, learning how to paddle in white water in rapids, go to the Madawaska Canoe Center. I recommend it with enthusiasm. The instruction there is first rate. We were there for a five-day course, and you you bring your tent and you know you sleep outside. They have rooms if you want to, or cabins if you want to. But we, we were sort of tenting, and that was an amazing experience. Uh, beat the heck out of our bodies, uh, but that was incredibly memory, memorable. So those are sort of the camping and canoeing related uh, experiences that are foremost. But to be honest, the, um, those are the things that are memorable because they're kind of unusual and exotic. But that's not what keeps us sort of going. What keeps us going is, is something more impactful. It's how satisfying it is to be out there, especially on a long trip. The longer that we're out there, the more you, start, you feel comfortable and at ease and you forget about the rest of the world and you just, you just don't care about those, those other concerns. You're only concerned with looking after your animal needs. And that's what our brains are for. Our brains are adapted and evolved for looking after our bodies. It may, it, to keep us hydrated, to keep us fed, to keep us sheltered, to keep maintain our body temperature, to keep, you know, to keep us safe, you know, to, to stay in the company of somebody else, and so forth. And and when you're out there, you are doing what your brain and your body is is exquisitely adapted and evolved to do. And that I think is is what I think many people who are into uh, camping and canoeing and bushcraft find so enjoyable. You exercise your intelligence, you exercise your body. Um, um, your resourcefulness and, and ingenuity is all brought to bear uh, in ways that you're, you, you are literally designed or adapted um, uh, to do. And so that is sort of, those are, the, those are moments that I, that I remember is, is those, those feelings of deep, deep satisfaction. There was a, an occasion, I'll, I'll give you a particular uh, example, just in the last canoe trip that we were on, we were gone for um, uh, 11 days uh, unintentionally. <laughs> Um, was it supposed to be that long? Um, and we were pinned down by rain and winds 
And at, at one point, we were literally laughing hysterically about the situation, about how we were just pinned down there and the wind was blowing horizontally, horizontal rain at us and stuff like that. We were under the tarp. We were warm and dry where we were um, because of our, our setup. But my goodness, we, we literally said we wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Right? And that sense of ease and complete satisfaction under conditions that if I was walking from my car to the grocery store in, in that kind of weather here in town, I would have hated every minute of it. But being out there, it just felt right and natural and normal. And I, it was great. And so that's sort of the, the most memorable stuff for me. It's, it's little moments like that. It's not a, it's not a trip. You know, it's not really a destination. It's, it's those feelings of deep satisfaction and sort of belonging. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really have a vocabulary for this, but but that it's that sense. I, I hope I can. I hope people are getting what I'm trying to. Yeah, right. I, I get it. I get it. You know, what? yeah, for sure. So you mentioned a few times in there, like your 11 day canoe trip. Is that perhaps one of your longest uh, adventures that you've had? Yeah, it is. Uh, we had planned an 11 day one uh, years ago, and um, I think I went out. I um, uh, can't remember why, but I seem to remember we I think we cut it short after eight days. But this last one was supposed to be seven to nine days we had originally planned it to be 11 days um uh, and uh something happened weather or illness i can't remember but we had to postpone it by two days so it was going to be a nine day trip and then maybe because of the weather we might come home early so it might be between seven and nine so we but we had food for 11 days with us anyway because we had originally packed for 11 days and we didn't unpack it so we went intending to go seven to nine days and then, as I say, we got windbound, and that's happened to us before, but never have we been windbound for three or four days consecutively at the end of a trip. So the nine-day trip turned unexpectedly into an 11-day trip. So that, that was the longest trip. Uh, but we, are, we had such a good time on that trip under those conditions that we, just, we said, you know, next year we've got to do longer. We've got to do a month. We've got to go somewhere really remote and do a month. So that's the plan for next summer. Well, nine days is my, my longest. I, I'd like, love to get in like a nice two week trip, maybe do something like the uh, the upper Mizanabi or sorry, the lower Mizanabi heading up to Moosini or something like that. That'd be that's always been on my bucket mm -hmm. list to do that trip. But uh, yeah, that'll happen. But I, I know I'm going to need a lot more than what I think that's like a actually an 18 day trip. It's a long distance, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here. Retired outside is saying, Martin, I know you've done lots of Crown Lake canoe tripping. But have you ever done Crown Land backpacking trip? How would you compare that to doing a canoe trip? Um, yeah, we've done um, uh, Crown Land uh, backpacking trips. I've done I've done them in summer. Uh, I've done them in winter, um, camping in igloo. I've done it in a hot tent. Um, it's uh, how, how does it compare? It's completely different. I mean, canoe tripping is its own thing, and that that to me is sort of the, the best form of camp, camping. That is the the, the form of the species of camping that I enjoy the most. Um, next, I, I, I would say winter camping. Um, and last is backpacking because I just, because when you're winter camping, you haul your gear um, on a sled behind you or on a toboggan behind you when you're on snowshoes. So in the case of canoe tripping, the canoe does the, most of the lifting. And in winter uh, camping, the sled or toboggan does most of the lifting. Backpacking, you are the pack animal who has to carry that stuff. And it's hot <laughs> and it's sweaty and sometimes buggy. Yeah. And so backpacking, although I've done a fair bit of it and some of it on Crown Land, that's the I, it doesn't compare as much. I don't like it as much. Um, and yeah, uh, they are both their own animal, basically, right? Apple yeah, apple. and you don't get the sense you don't get the sense of 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 a journey in the same way uh, as you do with a canoe. There's something about the portage of every time you have to do a portage, you leave a number of people behind. The more portages you do, the more you're, you're leaving civilization behind. Uh, the fewer campers and you're going to encounter, the more remote it's going to seem. And uh, it, that's harder to do when you're just on foot. You really have to walk a long way to get away from, from all of that. So I don't find it as satisfying. And so I do, I do less of it, but I do like it. And I do a lot of hikes on Kremlin. In fact, we bought a, a small parcel of, of land, 2.2 acres. I mean, it's nothing. It's just basically a place to park the car, but it's a bush lot surrounded by tens of thousands of hectares of crown land. And we bought it because it's surrounded by crown land. And, we can use that as a place to park our vehicle and, um, you know, we can camp on our little property, but whenever we want, we can, just, you know, shoot off in any, any number of directions and go on day trips and backpacking trips and hikes and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, so, 
so to retired outside, thank you, by the way. Um, uh, he's, a, he's an acquaintance of mine that I know through the, the paddling community. Um, and uh, it doesn't compare to me. Um, nothing compares to canoeing. That's the pinnacle of camping for me, it's canoe trip. Right now, where, where you're located, you're you're in uh, you're in the Muskoka area of Ontario. Yeah. yeah. Are you are you in a secluded area though, or are you are you in town? Um, or, no, I live I right in right. a location, but are you in a secluded area, or are you in a residential area? No, I'm in a I'm in a town, uh, right in, in the heart of a town. Okay. And uh, the Muskoka River flows through it, um, and so it's it, it's easy to go on little you know excursions uh, by myself uh, in in my little pack boat. Um, uh, but you know, it's surrounded by woods everywhere, all around this town. There's crown land everywhere. Like I, I'm not that far from Algonquin Park, but I, I literally, I never go into Algonquin Park. I don't, I seldom go on, on day trips and I don't go camping there. And I haven't been camping there in maybe, I don't know, eight years or something like that. Um, and not because I have anything against it, uh, but because all around Algonquin Park, there is more wilderness that looks exactly like Algonquin Park, but it's crown land. And uh, I know how to find it and where it is. And so I can go and avail myself of it whenever I like. And so that's what I do. And there's lots of advantages to crown land camping over camping in a park. So I prefer to do that. Yep. So Dan Schultz, now this is a nice segue into the question that we're kind of all almost already talking about with the crown land. He says he just stopped in to say hello to you. A uh, long time subscriber and really enjoys your videos. He's seen most of them because of them. He's learned to use the Ontario land use atlas, which as have I. I've heard of it before, and it's it's a little, it takes a little bit of getting used to and uh, working its way around. So for those of you that might be interested in something like that, if you are from Ontario and you're looking to find some crown land or or basically all the land in Ontario, whether it's private land or you know with claims and all that stuff. Check out uh, Martin's video on that because it is very, very handy. Maybe one of the moderators might be able to go through your uh, your uh, channel there and find the uh, the link to that there, and they could post that up. So, what what can you tell our viewers about that? Like trying to find Crown Land. I know that's what you spoke about at the symposium when you spoke in 2017. Did you not? Yeah. Um, so, well, that it was a winter camping symposium, and I had originally thought about talking about camping in igloo shelters and bring the, the issue of Crown Land into it. But uh, I am sort of a very passionate proponent of Crown Land camping. I encourage people to try Crown Land camping and to do to do more of it and I can get into the reasons why. But um, so at, on that occasion at the at the symposium, I felt I've got to bring up Crown Land camping. And I ended up talking more about Crown Land camping than winter camping. So uh, I, I think it was a bit of a, a misfire on my part to, to do that. Um, but um, um, yeah. I I was interested in Crown Land camping, and there is a there is an online tool that you can use called the Ontario Crown Land um, Policy Atlas or the Crown Land Use Policy Atlas. Um, and but it's hard to use. It's it, it is not intended for recreational um, uh, use. It is it is used for people who are in commerce. It's it's produce people who work for the Ministry um, of Natural Resources or in forestry management and stuff like that. People who are interested in resource extraction use this. It is a it, it is a, a digital electronic uh, map. It's an online utility, an interactive map um, that shows you where all the crown land is. It, it doesn't show, just show you the crown land. As you said, it shows you all the private land and provincial parks and so forth. So um, uh, I started learning how to use this. My wife and I sorted out how to use it. In fact, she was, she's actually um, more skilled at it than I am. And then we decided we need to make a video on how to use this because more people would avail themselves of, of camping and hiking and canoeing on Crown Land if they knew how to use this darn interactive tool. Because the hardest thing about Crown Land is finding it and navigating on it. Nobody knows where it is. And um, and obtaining paper maps that have that information is just well, it's hopeless. Um, so I once we sorted out how to use this darn utility, we set about making a video. So if you're interested in, in how to find Crown Land in Ontario, uh, you can just go to YouTube and type in Ontario Crown Land, uh, and you'll see my videos. They usually pop up right at the top. Um, and I have a set of walkthrough instructions on how to use that, that atlas. And the, the interface has changed slightly, but all the functions are exactly the same. So some things are in slightly different positions, but it's an extremely detailed kind of almost tedious 
uh, walk through on how to use this thing to locate crown land near you if there is any near you and if there isn't any near you at least the, the nearest crown land to you that you can find so we set about um, making that video because we wanted people to to make use of crown land because crown land is our land it's ours it's public land and now <laughs> for now <laughs> well yes exactly for now and and that, that's my concern part of my my reason for yeah or promoting it is 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 political. It, it's it's that crown land gets eventually it gets sold off in bits and pieces, and what doesn't get sold off in in, in bits and pieces sometimes um, gets uh, used um, by commercial interests for resource extraction. You know, mineral extraction. You know, wood and stuff like that. And I don't want to see our precious crown lands that are ours to use that are largely untouched wilderness or wilderness that was once law that is, you know. Uh, rebounded. I don't want to see it all going to those kinds of commercial interests. I'd like to see it being not falling into private or commercial hands, but being used um, uh, the way that we would, those of us who enjoy the outdoors would like to see it used. Low impact uh, recreational use, things like hiking and camping and canoeing and snowshoeing and so forth. Um, and unless people discover Crown Land and start playing on it and enjoying it, um, they're not going to care about it. You, you can't. You can't be concerned and try to protect what you don't know exists and what you don't value. And so my mm -hmm. my idea was, if people know about it, they'll 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 try it. They'll see the advantages and benefits of it over camping in a provincial park, for instance, and they'll be concerned about it. And they might might be moved to try to protect it. Uh, because once you discover a piece of crown land, once you find a little route or a place to camp or canoe or or, or snowshoe or winter camp or whatever, it becomes yours. That you you take ownership. That you, you, Stewardship sort of takes over. Uh, you feel as if it belongs to you, and um, and that doesn't happen if it's just some nameless wilderness and you don't know if it's privately owned or not. Uh, so that was the idea behind uh, making those videos, and that's why so many of my videos kind of prattle on endlessly about Crown Land and how we discover it and what you you do. And it's not just how to find Crown Land. We discuss the the, the ethics and the best practices when you're out there, what you should and shouldn't do, what you may and may not do. All of that's covered in, in my videos. So I would encourage anyone who's at all curious about Crown Land Camping to check out those videos um, and get some of them under your, under your belt uh, so that you know how to find it, but also so that you, you don't become one of those people that are just sort of wrecking and trashing the place. Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing too, because uh, long before uh, Kevin introduced you and I, well, long before a couple of weeks ago when we first met all by here, I, I was... Uh, perusing through and somebody had told me about about that resource and I was looking it up and sure enough I went on there actually I think it was uh, are you familiar with kid products uh, yeah the twig stove yeah uh, yeah absolutely Ingo. yeah yeah, yeah. Ingo, the old one of the owners one of the four partners there he was telling me about it and I went on there and of course he told me he says check out this video you got to see this video because <laughs> the video explains it and it happened to be you so that's uh yeah. that's pretty awesome that uh I was in tune with you before I was in tune with you, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see here. So we got uh, Brian J says Marty took his first solo trip this year in Algonquin and found that he had a hard time settling at night. Sounds like you don't have any trouble. Uh, any tips to settle the mind? Uh, uh, Brian J, that's a very common problem, and it's one that I share with you. I, I I am not someone who just you know peacefully falls asleep. I'm I'm slightly barophobic, uh, and uh, any mouse or chipmunk that's running around in the, in the night, or I immediately assume it's a bear, and I sleep with one eye open. And it only happens the first night. Second night, it's not almost never a problem. And by the third night, it's never a problem. I just fall asleep. But every time I go out, it doesn't matter. I mean, I could have been out there for like, you know, 11 days, and I could be back in town for a week and go back out there again. And that first night, I'm going to have a hard time sleeping. I think part of it is just the first night, you're kind of overtired. Um, and your mind is racing and everything and the outdoors feels unfamiliar again and your campsite doesn't feel like home because you haven't been there long enough but once you've been in your campsite for a couple of days i find it starts to feel like home it looks familiar and and that sense of familiarity sort of chases away the fears so um i have a hard time settling at night uh l largely out of uh, completely irrational concern that i'm going to be mauled by a bear uh, so if that's your concern um it, it probably goes away if you're out there long enough. Uh, and um, I, I am more concerned when I'm solo. I mean, this happens even with my wife. My wife is fearless, by the way. She just thinks I'm an idiot for, for you know, 
not falling asleep effortlessly. But, but um, when I'm alone, um, those thoughts intrude on me just during the day. I'm going about my business and stuff like that. And, and so I talk to myself. You know, everyone knows that when you're hiking through the woods, it's a good practice sort of to talk and, you know, say shoe bear or get away you bears and stuff like that. You know, when you're rounding a band or over a hill, you don't want to surprise a bear or something like that. And I find that talking to myself actually helps. And then eventually I, I, that just goes away. It just wears off. So I don't know if this is a good practical advice for you, but I find that being out there more than one or two nights really just chases that away. Um, and uh, when I'm by myself, uh, talking to myself really helps. It, I, I sort of disabuse myself of this irrationality just in the course of being tired of, of thinking about it. Right. And, and then it just goes away. It just fades away. But I, it, it's a recurring condition. Every time I go out there, it happens to me again, usually the first night. Yeah, but what, what's the first uh, the first trigger? Eh? If you see some bear scat or something like that. I had, uh, yeah, <laughs> I did my very first, like I've been canoeing for over 35 years now, and I did my very first solo trip this year when I bought my, uh, my Swift canoe. And I went to Algonquin Park. I figured, great place to go because, you know, there's people around. If I run into any problems, you know, the Calvaries will come charging in, right? Well, I'll tell you, I've never seen so many bear signs of bear in my life. Uh, I, I usually take my dog Molly with me on the trip, so I'm, I'm always a firm believer that if there's a scent of a dog in the camp, it'll keep the bears away. But I know I know that's not always the case, right? But we had in the what in the in the video, there's uh there's one campsite I, I camped on, and I guess a bear must have, and I I, I was told by a hunter. I guess in the springtime, bears eat dandelions and they unplug from their winter food storage. And it looked like it looked like a pardon the pun or the, the language of everybody, it looked like a shit explosion all over this campsite. It, it it was everywhere. It was everywhere, like spattered up on cedar trees and like around the bases. And it was it was, a, it was a nasty mess. Eh? And I'm thinking to myself, wow, <laughs> there's a big bear around here somewhere. <laughs> it's like so a little unsettling, but it usually doesn't affect me. Uh, I go like way north, you know, north of uh, of Timmins or north of or Sudbury, like up in them areas for my canoe trips. And it never really worries me. We've never really had a bad experience with a bear in all the years I've been not wood in all the years we've been canoeing. So, yeah. you know, what's, you know, what's funny about this is yeah, I have this irrational fear and it happens usually at night, right? Uh, when you cannot see very far, right? right. And you're in the tent and you can't see outside your tent, right? But what's funny is on those occasions where we have seen bears, we were not afraid, right? And we have seen bears. I remember one time we were on that, uh, in a, in a, that trip that we had planned it would be uh, 11 days, it turned out to be about eight. And on that occasion, we saw, we had three bear sightings. Um, and I don't know how many, if, if we were seeing the same bear more than once, but well, that's not true. We had five bear sightings um, in three different locations. So, you know, we, we think there might have been as many as three bears. Um, but the first time uh, we were sitting in camp and I heard this noise. We're sitting uh, in a in a, our camp where we were canoe camping and we were on this long, narrow lake. And across the lake, I heard the unmistakable clacking sound like a stone being flipped over, stone on stone, like someone picking up a brick and dropping it. Um, and I went, uh-oh, I know what that is. That's a bear flipping rocks over, looking for grubs and things like that to eat. And I got up, I bolted up, and I grabbed the binoculars. And I said, what's the matter? I said, I think, I, I think there's a bear. And I looked, and sure enough, there across the the, uh, the lake was a bear. And it was moving along the, the, the opposite shore and eating blueberries and foraging and stuff like that. And what did we do? We didn't run or anything like that. We hopped in the canoe and paddled over <laughs> to get a better look. <laughs> yeah. and every time we have had... Um, uh, uh, some kind of encounter with a bear where we've seen a bear. Uh, they've never bothered us. They've all, they always just disappear when they you know, we get too close. Um, and, and it's magical. I, I love it. It's, it's fantastic. But there was one day we were walking through the woods on Crown Land. We were on a Crown Land hike actually. Uh, and uh, a mama bear and her two little cubs walked by. You know, it was, as we said, it was a three bear day. And we were so excited about it. I, we literally, I, I coined a little song, you know, you know, you know uh, well, I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to embarrass myself by saying it. But anyway, it, it was a three bear day and we were delighted. So I, the, 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 the fear is completely irrational. I don't know why I have it because when I have seen the bears, it has been magical and unforgettable.
<laughs> so I'm just looking at a comment here from uh, Bass to North. He says, Back Road MacBook is a great resource as well. I've never actually heard of that. Uh, have you heard of that, Martin? I've heard of it. I've not used it. Uh, there's a, a, a phone app that we use called, uh, I think it's called Backcountry Demo. Um, I think it's called Backcountry Maps. It's anyway, it's an app and it shows uh, Crown Land. And there's a free demo mode that, that you can use. Um, well, they, they also they also do a, a book, do they not? I, I see it at uh, Outdoor Show. Actually, I think I've got one. Back, Backcountry Road Maps, it's called? Yeah, I don't think yeah. it's the same thing. I don't think it's the same thing. No. But it could be. It could be. Um, uh, anyway, it's a it's an interactive uh, map. You can use it kind of like like Google Maps and, and that kind of thing um, in in real time uh, to navigate it. And um, on a trip that we took this summer um, to Georgian Bay, our GPS failed. Um, just the batteries conked out, and um, and we used that uh, with our, our phone because we had cell signal, and it, it worked beautifully. And we were able to navigate effortlessly with that. Um, so. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of electronic things if you if you look for them, but I recommend using the Crown Land Policy Atlas to when you're at home to look and find uh, places where you could potentially camp and hike and explore and snowshoe and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I hear the itinerary, it's funny that, that a lot of the people are actually taking us in the direction that we were kind of heading with with our whole uh, itinerary for this show, anyways. Because uh, I had the question there about, uh, can you explain the advantages and disadvantages of canoe tripping on Crown Land versus provincial parks such as Algonquin or Killarney or, you know, uh, any of the others? Yeah, sure. Well, there's all kinds of advantages. Uh, well, first and foremost, there's no fees. Okay, so if you're a legal resident of, of the province of Ontario, for instance, um, you don't have to pay. Um, uh, there's no charge. Now, if you're a non-resident, if you're out of the province, if you're from out of the province or if American citizen or something, there's a fee that you have to pay to the ministry. It's like 9.35 plus tax or something per night uh, per person. But I mean, if you live in Ontario uh, and you want to camp on Crown land, or if you live in Manitoba and you want to camp, camp on the Crown land there, there's, there's no fees. It's, it's it's your land. You're allowed to to, uh, to camp there. And um, you can um, spend up to 21 days in one spot before you have to move. Uh, and they just have that rule so that people don't just start squatting on Crown land. Um, so that's one advantage. You can you can be out there for some fairly extended periods of time uh, at, at no cost. Um, there's no booking. There's no reserving uh, ahead of time. Uh, there's no schedule to keep. So in a, you know if you, you want to go to Killarney or Algonquin Park or Mississauga or in, any of those places, you have to book ahead of time. You have to reserve. You know. Uh, but then there's a schedule that you have to keep. You know you have to say. You know, I'm going to be on this campsite on this lake on this day, and then the next day I'm going to be there, and then two days later I'm going to be over here. On Crown Land, you don't do that. You come and go as you please. If the weather is foul and you want to stay put, you stay put. If you're not feeling well and you don't want to go, you don't move anywhere. If you don't like the site that you're on, you want to get out of there, you go, and you go in any direction that you want as long as you're on Crown Land. So there's no schedule or route that they have to keep. Yeah. Um, so you have complete freedom of, of movement, and you're not restricted to a specific site um, or route at all. And and so this means that there's more spontaneity for departure times. You can go when you want. You know, you don't, um, you know, you're not limited by you know when that site or that lake is is open and not overbooked. Um, uh, you can relocate to other campsites um, whenever you need to. Uh, the duration of your trips is open. You're not paying ahead of time. So if you, if you want to bug out because the weather's foul or something like that, or you're not feeling well, there's no money lost, right? So. Your, your schedule is, is, is more flexible. And the routes are not always established. Like um, we recently, in this 11 uh, day trip that we took, we followed an established route on Crown Land. Uh, in fact, I've got a series of videos coming out. It's a long trip report about um, our, our last trip to the um, Island Lake and Barrens Conservation Reserve, which is Crown Land. Uh, but it's, it's, it's an established canoe route. There's a, the, the portages are not marked, but they're, they're clear, they're evident. The campsites are not marked. There's no signs or anything like that, but they're evident. You can see them from shore. Oh, that's clearly a campsite. The area is clear. There's firing and so forth, right? Uh, and they're, they're they're but but typically these these routes, even when they're they're established, um, they're they're easy to um, uh, to find and use. But even when they're not well established, um, that's even better because when when you have to find where the portage is because there's no sign and you don't have a map that tells you you go from here to here and the portage is there and the campsite's over there when you have to literally discover it 
that gives you a greater sense of, of, of discovery. So that's one of the things I, I love about it, right? Uh, and very often the, the areas you're going to are a little bit more remote and isolated. So there's going to be fewer people because it's, it's not a park. It's, it's not booked, you know, every weekend with some, something, somebody. And so all of this gives you a sort of a greater aesthetic experience. There's opportunity uh, to find better, less impacted sites. Um, for instance, if you go into Algonquin or places like that, uh, the sites often are beaten down to bare ground, exposed roots everywhere, no firewood to be found. On Crown land, that's never the issue. It's never. Never. And if you're into bushcraft, as we are, there are opportunities for practicing your bushcraft skills. You know, uh, there are things that you simply cannot do in a provincial park, right? You're not allowed to forage, for instance, for wild edibles. That's a no-no, right? Uh, that they're, that, you know, that's all there for the wildlife. It's not there for you to pick. Um, if you uh, uh, want to um, uh, uh, build some uh, primitive uh, camp furniture or something like that, uh, the, the type that you can leave behind and decompose or that you can dismantle afterwards, you can do that. There's all kinds of things that you can do. You can cut down small saplings to build a tripod or a lean-to and so forth. And that's perfectly legal on Crown land as long as you do so responsibly and ethically. Uh, and don't leave a mess or anything like that. Don't leave tarps and plastic nylon line around and stuff like that. Right? But you're allowed to do that. So you can exercise your bushcraft skills. Uh, and another sort of reward or benefit is that um, all of this extra work that you're doing, making your camp, right? Because you very often there isn't, a, isn't an established campsite. So you have to build the fire ring. You have to figure out where you're going to put your tent and clear a spot. You have to figure out where you're going to string your tarp. Um, you have to build a, a, a latrine, like a cheek spreader latrine uh, or something like that. Um, you are making the campsite. You're not moving into a wilderness hotel where, oh, there's the fire ring. That's where I hang my food barrel. That's where I have to go poop. That's where I pitch my tent. This is where I string my jar. Very often, when you go to a, a provincial park, those decisions about where everything goes are made for you. And so you're moving into a wilderness hotel. Crown land, you have to make your camp very often. Not always, very often there are established campsites, but often there are not. And that's way more fun. So there's, there is, there is a sense of exploration and it feels like a more authentic and traditional uh, form of camping. And there's just a greater sense of exploration uh, and joys of discovery. Uh, you have to make on the spot decisions and you happen upon things that you, no one knew was there. You make independent discoveries. So all of that, it, th those are just some of the advantages and the kinds of rewards and benefits of, of town land camping. Yeah, for sure. You know what? It's funny because this year, when, uh, like I say, I went on my first solo trip ever, and it happened to be at Algonquin Park. And I'm not one who frequents the uh, the provincial parks in Ontario myself, just just for that reason. I don't like being told where I have to be, when I have to be there, what lake are you going to be on? Oh, there's no, and and everywhere you look, there's an orange sign, and you know it, it tells you where you have to be. My my the guys that I regularly canoe with, we always. Uh, we we use the resource a lot. Uh, the my my CCR. Uh, oh yeah, right. Yeah. it's a great forum, you know, and you can find trips on there. But we always try to find these trips that are uh, like sort sort of forgotten canoe routes. And one of the ones that we did this year was that Nepquasi trip. And it, every campsite that we visited on this trip, which there weren't very many, if we found them, uh, you could tell they hadn't been used. Uh, mm. you know, in quite a long time, you know, you, the telltale signs. There's no ash in the fire pit, and you got plants going through it, right? So they, they're uh, th those are the kind of trips I like to take. They're more adventurous, and like you say, struggle for firewood. Go to Algonquin Park, and you can hike a half a mile in and still see the lake because yeah. every dead standing, every shrub, every bush is cleared right out. The only thing left are the big pines, right? Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, it's it, it's it's kind of a shame, but you know what? I would say, and not 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 as an insult, but keep that for the people who who want that experience. You know what I mean? Some people are more in their comfort zone going. Like I said, I went to some place that I could go and actually paddle. And if I run into problems on a solo trip, there's the Calvary, right? So, yeah. Well, actually, that's really important actually uh, to mention that because you know we all come to camping um, with different degrees of experience, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people start camping, they start by car camping. You know, they'll go to Algonquin and they'll, you know, be parked at New Lake or something like that in a campground with a trailer or, you know, 
all their gear in the trunk and backseat of their car or something like that. He did wash rooms and all, showers and all the rest of it. Um, right, but you got to start somewhere. And then people will very often they'll they'll move up to backpacking and stuff like that. You know, tenting and, and you know short things like that. But canoeing is a for some people that's a big step. First of all, you have to learn how to canoe. <laughs> Right, um, and then the gear you have to pack is different, and you have to do things differently because you know there's always the chance of a spill and stuff like that. And you you are getting more remote, you are getting further away from people, right? And so a place like Algonquin or, or Killarney, all those places that have established canoe routes that are well marked, campsites that are well well maintained and well marked and stuff like that, that that is that's important because you have to learn how to camp, and you have to learn how to camp in places like that. I would never recommend if you've never been camping. Oh, just you know. Consult the Crown Land uh, Use Policy Atlas and just strike off. I mean, something could, bad could happen. Um, not that you can get mauled by a bear or anything like that, but I mean, you could just, you know, twist an ankle. No one's going to know where you are. And if you don't know how to camp, any number of things can go wrong. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there are sort of degrees of, of wilderness experience, right? And then, so, and I think of someone like, um, you know, Jim Baird and T uh, Tim ba uh, Ted Baird, you know, who, uh, I mean, they are, you know, real wilderness um, uh, adventurers, right? They go into incredibly remote places, right? I mean, they're doing a, a, a form of hardcore camping that I'd be scared to do, you know? Well, actually, I, I would like to do it, but <laughs> I, I, may, I may be past the age. Um, Come on, you would do it. Well, we do it, so I would do it with someone who had that, that degree of experience. Sure. Right? But that's just it. Like, if you don't have someone to show you, and you're going to have to sort of learn how to do this on your own or with a buddy who's not any more experienced than you, then you better be going into places that are a little bit tamer and not quite so remote and quite so wild and where there's so much more work. And crownland camping is a bit more work because you navigating takes more time when you're not following an established route with a clear route map and signs directing you and, 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 a, and a site that's ready to receive you and, and so forth. But, I mean, you know, it gets dark pretty fast when you have to find your way and you don't know if there's a way and you might, it's getting dark and oh well we're just gonna have to make a bush site wherever the heck we can now and yeah, you know, yeah. and that's happened to us and been in that situation yeah. many times yeah that's great I'm fun right into what tina here has put i've got it on the screen you have a plan b if someone happens to be on or near the crown land destination site i I, ha I have something to say for that because it doesn't affect me too much when i solo camp because I, I hang in a, a hammock i sleep in a hammock for a tent camper different story yeah, yeah. So if you're tenting, obviously you need uh, a, a a spot that is relatively clear and flattish, right? Um, and sometimes there isn't. <laughs> you might end up in a spot where there's just it's not a great place, or or the only spots uh, are sort of established sites and someone's there. So, uh, Tina, in answer to your question, what do you do? Uh, you just go somewhere else. You just move off somewhere else. Um, that's the nice thing about Crown Land. Oh, there's only one area that's cleared as a site, and 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 suitable, well, we're just gonna do what our ancestors did for millennia. I'm just gonna strike off into the bush and I'm just gonna make a site. It's not gonna be ideal. It won't be ideal water access. It might not be as open as I would like. Uh, it might feel a little claustrophobic because there's a lot of vegetation and, and branches and stuff like that that I'm gonna have to do a bit of clearing and stuff like that. The tent site might not be uh, perfectly flat and level, but you know, that's that them's the breaks. But you will never forget that, that feeling of making pure bush your home. I, I love that feeling. I love, if you go to my channel, you'll see I've got videos on our process on on how we set up and establish a, a Crown Land campsite responsibly with minimal impact and, and stuff like that. And it's fun. I mean, it's, it's not a chore. It's not at all a chore. It's play. Camping this way in, in a more primitive way um, is just play. It's just fun. Everything you love about camping is sort of turned up a notch when you're when you're on Crown Land, and it's not an established route, and it's not an established site. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you know what? We're uh, we're hitting the eight o'clock mark, and just uh, was sticking within the itinerary here. I do want to do my giveaway, and what we'll do is after the giveaway, uh, I'm going to open up, and we'll get a couple people here on panel with us. If anybody has questions for Martin or myself uh, and you'd like to join on panel, I will drop a link and feel free to pipe in. We can only get as many as six people on here, but I'm going to try and maybe control it where we can get a person on screen, ask you a question or ask myself a question and um, we can answer answer from that. And then if we have time left before the nine o'clock uh, period, we'll, uh, we'll open it up to a bunch of people in panel. So hopefully that'll work well. 
Um, just wanted to acknowledge, we've got a few other people in the house, uh, somebody that I'm, I'm actually quite excited to see, and that's uh, Marie Johns. Um, if you uh, if you were on the show last week, we had a, a young guest on the show. That was uh, Millie from the Bushcraft Daughter. And I've been talking with Millie and asking her if she's been interested or if she'd be interested in doing the same type of thing that we're doing here, uh, Martin. And uh, she has said yes. And her mom has stopped in here uh, in her presence uh, to say hi. I just wanted to say hi and thank you very much for popping in. It means a lot. And uh, we're excited to have Millie on the show here in a couple of weeks. And, uh, yeah, that's that's something good. I, I, I really like that. I'm really pumped by her stuff. And she gives great inspiration to young ladies all over the place, right? Yeah. So uh, at this point, um, just like I have been doing over the last few weeks, I've got uh, some Canoe Hound Adventure decals. And I've got two sets of three I would like to give away to a couple of the people that are in the stream tonight. And I think what we're going to do uh, tonight is, and I've been doing it the same way, I'm going to give you two letters. Uh, put your cap locks on on your computer. And I'm going to tell you two letters. Knock those two letters into the, the, the keyboard. And then uh, once once everybody's in, I have two numbers that are written on a notepad up here behind me that will correspond with my live chat. Unfortunately, you have to take my word for it. I mentioned that last week too. And then uh, the winner will get uh, two decal packs, which you can actually put on your, your water bottles, uh, bumpers of your car. Stick one, I always say stick around granny's forehead. And uh, if you if you check my Facebook link, you'll see uh, one of our winners last week actually sent me a picture of him putting one on his bottle, and that's uh, Jess from uh, uh, Rain Dance Bushcraft. So, in keeping with our guest, ready for typing in? Put in P M Pine Martin. P M. Let's populate that chat, people. And th this is where we cue the. Uh, the, the doo, 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 doo. Come on, Martin. <laughs> That's it, people. Let's get PM on the board. That's awesome. I see we got a great crowd tonight, eh? We've got about 30 people uh, in the house. It's been pretty steady tonight. Uh, I think we're having a great time tonight. I am, anyways. Uh, I, 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 I want to do a little shout out, if you'll permit me. Um, yeah, for sure. The Wild Yam uh, is there. She posted a question earlier. I have been following her channel from early days, and her channel has really, really grown. It's really taken off. She makes excellent content. So uh, Jen's her name. Uh, Jen, hello. Thanks for, for stopping in. And I hope people will check out uh, your channel. Just just look for The Wild Yam. She's on Facebook and YouTube and all of the things. Um, and her, her YouTube content is uh, terrific. Uh, she talks about gear. She has an off-grid cabin uh, uh that she spends time in uh and i don't know i just learned a ton of stuff from from her over the years and she's been a subscriber of mine um uh, maybe even longer i think uh but i've seen her channel from early days and it's really grown it's just you know exploded so uh people should check it out too, so well, maybe uh, maybe i get my maybe moderator Dave to uh to put her link in there and everybody can go check out her channel if uh if it's uh pine martin approved it's canoe Hound adventures approved so <laughs> all right anyway so we've uh we've started i think everybody's piped in about as much as they're going to and we've got started at uh adrian from true north angler who's actually the first one to get in with the pm so i'm going to pull up my thing here and we got numbers four and number seven so i'm going to count down number four is uh one two three four daniel Millot. so daniel I know Daniel actually. He's a friend. Oh, do you? Oh, okay. yeah, nice yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. He's actually had a couple questions. Then we got uh, four, five, six, and Hunt Shack Wilderness Experience. Another Northern Ontario boy. So what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to post right now on the uh, bottom of the stream my email address. And if you uh, if you can send me an email with uh, your complete mailing address, what I will do is I by week's end I will send you out your uh, your sticker packs. I congratulate you guys on winning that. It's nothing big, but it's just an appreciation uh, thing that uh, I can show for you guys actually participating in the chat. This is awesome, awesome stuff. So yeah, drop me an email, name, and full address, mailing address as you would have it sent to you. And I'll get them out to you this week. So 
at this point there, I think what we'll do, uh, Martin, if it's cool with you, I'm going to open up. If anybody would like to uh, to get onto the chat to uh, to join in on the conversation, just let me get the link here. Comments. I got to catch up. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I missed any questions earlier. The uh, it's hard to keep up with the chat and the whole conversation thing at the same time. So here is the link. Paste. There we go. So. Uh, Chat. There we go. So, if anybody would like to uh, to join in on the uh, on the chat here, or has any comments or any questions for myself or Martin, please do uh, join in. Let's get to strike up a bit of a conversation and have a good time with the uh, the remaining fifty minutes that we have going here. I'm sure somebody will pop in, and I knew it was going to be good old Uncle Sty. <laughs> Hello, Sty. How are you tonight? Pretty good. How about yourselves? Oh, uh, you know what? Having an absolute hoop. This is a good time. We got uh, Martin's a great guy, great guest. Yes. Hello again, Sty. Um, uh, hey. <laughs> I awesome show, Dennis. Awesome. That's my first comment. Awesome show. Thank you, Sty. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Yes. Sty, I've been trying to go through your back catalog of videos, and I remember you saying, "Oh, I've got something like 400 videos." You really have 400 videos. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't know where to start. Like, so if you give me some pointers, but I mean, I I was just going through, just picking randomly a video here, a video here, um, since we, we first met. And oh my goodness, I, well, I don't if, know. If, yeah. Well, if yeah, it's, it's intimidating for a little guy like me who's <laughs> made like thirty videos. <laughs> what one spot you might enjoy is um, if you go on my homepage, go down the playlist, and watch the Lean To series. Oh, okay. Right. The lean to series where I construct a lean to out at camp, out at our that's that's our um training camp. We we had a training camp, wilderness yeah. training. And I actually used that lean to for clients for one season. Um allowed my clients, you know, they they kind of fought over it. Because <laughs> we put we put our clients in what we called pods. They were I don't know if any of you have ever seen them, but Cabela's used to make an outfitter's tent that you could buy these add-on pods that were large enough to put a cod in and you could put your gear in them and they attached to the sides of that outfitting tent. And so we had the big outfitter's tent and that was my base camp out at camp. I lived in the tent all through our training season. Well, I had all the pods that came with it and I thought, well, some of my clients, they didn't like cowboy sleep in the first couple of days while they were building uh, debris shelters. So I said, well, I'll put pods up for my clients and let them sleep in those. They're kind of comfortable. They're like a giant pup tent, you know, and because you can use them standalone. And well, I ended up, we ended, the company ended up buying a ton of them. We, I, I think we had a total of, 30 of them and um they're not cheap they were at that time they were over 300 bucks a piece and um i had the first once i got my lean, lean to done and i had done some winter camping in it and you'll see that in that in that list um the winter camps there but the next spring my first group of clients seven clients all these nice, beautiful pods for them to stay in. They all had their own little fire pits, everything. It's You couldn't ask for anymore. And I showed them the whole camp, walked them through the, we had 80 acres, and walked them through the whole properties. And when they saw that lean-to, they go, well, why can't we stay in something like that? Right. And I'm going, because there's only one. <laughs> <laughs> and it's mine. <laughs> and it's mine. And they said, well, you stay in the big tent. And I said, well, I like to stay out here too. And they said, come on, you got to let, let us use it. And I said, how are we going to do that? I said, there's seven of you. And they said, we're here for seven days. So let's all draw numbers out of a hat and each of us get it one night. So yeah. each time I had a group of clients, I would let them do that. But cool. so I would tell you that that'd be kind of the place to start gives you kind of the, the gist of what, I was doing out there um, during the camp wilderness thriving fundamentals days. Otherwise, it all depends. And you love water. Uh, you might want to watch my waterfalls um, 
list, you know, my, my playlist of waterfalls that I love to hike into. And um, there's not, a, there's, a, there's a, there's a few videos, but those are recent. You'll probably see those on the first, you know, you yeah. scan one well, page I, I'll of videos of me kayaking because <laughs> yeah. I just got my kayak. I saw that one actually. I saw, I saw one of you on, on your, you, it's a sit on top kayak that you have. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, uh, just a cheapy sit on kayak and, I'm trying to figure out. I got I got everybody saying, "Come and visit me here, and visit me there next year, and this and that." And all the travels I'm going to make. Dennis is on the list. I, you know, somehow I'll meet you all, you guys. <laughs> um, but next summer I'll be heading up. I'm going to go up through Saint Sault Saint Marie, cut across through Canada, come back down through Maine. I got folks in Maine to visit, and then someone, a couple people in New York, and then one in Pennsylvania. So. That'll be a month long tour I'll probably take. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, it all depends on resources, but I, I'm, I'm really looking at getting myself. I tell you what, that, that 12 foot Swift is just, I, I, oh, oh yeah. I have a hard time saying no. Um, yeah, it depends on, on, on your size. Like uh, I'm, I'm not a big guy, so I'm about, I, I range between 140 and 150 pounds, and I'm 5'10. And my camping gear is really light; like it's really it all fits into one 75 liter pack. That's a canoe pack. Sure. And um, so, if you're going to just be day tripping, um, uh, you know, that might be fine. If you're going to be canoe tripping, but you're you know bigger than me and you have heavier gear and stuff like that, then go with the 13.6. But I, I yeah. like the 12. We're talking about a pack boat, by the way, for people who aren't familiar. We're right. talking about a pack boat. And a pack boat is a hybrid between a kayak and a canoe. It's got the, right. the shape, the, the lower hollow shape like a kayak, but it's open like a canoe. You paddle right. it with a double blade, and um, it, and I have the smaller model, the smallest one that Swift makes. It's, it's twelve feet. And I, the reason I like the Swift uh, twelve foot, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but um, yeah, the last time we were on, but um, I like the I like the, sh the how, how short it is because. Um, it allows you to ride in and uh, out of the troughs of waves. Um, and I, I found that the 13.6, it's, it's, it's longer, pointier, and it tended to plunge through waves, whereas the 12 foot tends to ride the waves, right. to take you up and down. So it's kind of like a roller coaster. So Dennis said that in that little promo video I did, I was, I was um, uh, battling some wind and waves and you could see me bouncing up and down. And, and, and th that's true. <laughs> um, yeah. But you, you, it is it is fun, and you don't get as wet. As a boat that plunges through just sprays a lot of water at you, and that's why right. I went for when you were and, yeah. when you did your um, video on why you chose the twelve footer, I watched that video now three times, <laughs> and you do mention that in there why that was one of the reasons you went with the twelve is because of the plunging the thirteen six did in yeah. in rough seas. And see, that's the issue for me is, is I won't be doing week long, two week long trips anymore, but I might go out three days or four days. Right. The thing is, is my put in spot will be in Boundary Waters on a lake. It's Burnside Lake in Ely, just outside of Ely, Minnesota. The problem with Burnside Lake is that's about 24 miles long, that lake, and it of course, the lake's got to run east and west. So, and it's a deep lake. So you get out there and there's times that wind will kick up and you'll have crests that are six, eight feet. And and that could happen. You wouldn't see it coming. You'd be partway across that lake and then it, that would hit you. And, um, and I've been on that lake with with in two guys, you know, two of us in a canoe, full gear, and have those winds hit us, and oh my gosh, if, you know, we, we just wished and prayed that we had a skirt on the thing, because, I, I mean, you're, you're just fighting not, not to swamp it, you know? Yeah, well, if you're in if you're in in chop like that, um, nothing but a closed canoe or a skirted. Um, right, and I was going to ask you, do, do they have skirts for the twelve and the thirteen six? Can you not, get them? I, I'm not aware that they make anything like that. So you know, I, we got yeah. a sail maker up here that says he can make a skirt for any kayak or canoe ever built. So 
I, I was just wondering because he's That's a, a pretty bold claim. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you, you should see some of the work he's done. I just got a really quick question here from uh, the Wild Yam. This might be one for uh, for Pine Martin there or Martin there. Uh, thoughts on pack rafts? I felt that they may be a good solution for merging backpacking and hiking remote areas. I'm not sure what a pack raft is, but maybe you might. Yeah, I do, uh, and I have had the same thought that that uh, Jen at the Wild Yam has has had. So a pack raft is an inflatable canoe. It doesn't look that much like a canoe. It kind of looks like a long pointy dinghy. Um, Doesn't Joe have one of those now? Uh, Joe Robinette? Um, yeah. Not that I'm aware of, but he might. Uh, they're, they're, they're increasingly um, uh, in use now. They're just really growing in popularity because they're incredibly light. They, they can be as light as five or seven pounds. They fit handsomely inside of a backpack, and yeah. backpackers use them. They go mountaineering, and then they, they you know, there's these you know big mountaintop lakes and stuff like that, and they can uh, they can paddle them. And it, that would be great for me because I know a number of lakes – that I would like to paddle. Some of them are sizable and they have islands on them and stuff like that. I would love to explore them, but I'd have to portage my canoe for hours and hours through uncleared bush, which is impossible. I mean, these are portage trails, right? But if I had a backpack, I could just bushwhack through um, with this little pack raft in my backpack and I could camp out there and I could, so yeah, and they're very, very durable. Um, uh, they have multiple chambers. Um, so that, you know, if, if, if there's a puncture or something like that, you're not just going to sink and stuff like that. Some of them have, uh, compartments. So those, those, um, you can, um, kind of like a kayak has compartments you for storage and stuff like that. Right. So pack rafts are, 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 uh, very, very, uh, popular in some quarters among some, uh, some backpackers. So, and it'd be perfect for someone like me who's interested in finding obscure little lakes on crown land in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by bush and no, no, uh, no accessible portages. So yeah, Jen, I, I would love to, uh, to try that out, but they're really expensive. Like they're they're a couple of thousand bucks. They're like they range from like you know eight hundred and and up uh, for the low end models. Um, so they're very very expensive, um, and I, I don't know of anybody in Canada who makes one. There's, I think there's one country uh, Canadian company that makes them. Coco Pelli um, uh, makes them. I think, I think it's Coco Pelli. I think that's the name of the company. Um, there's a there's a bunch of companies. If you look up Pack Raft, B A C K Raft, uh, you'll see them. But yeah, I would love to. Own so yeah. if anyone wants to lend me one, right? <laughs> yeah, there you go. I'll try, try it out. out here, right? I'll try it out. We yeah. we had we we had an outfit up here. I don't remember the makes of the make of them though. And they had like six of them up here in Cornucopia, Wisconsin. Um, we've got a big kayak outfitter up here for the apostle islands and the sea caves and and they rent kayaks out and, and but they had somebody up there demoing some of those um pack rafts and i didn't get to go out and one what but my buddy did and he said he said it was comfortable he said everything's generally soft you know it's 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 inflatable so it's generally it's feel soft uh, not cushy soft but soft and he said the only issue he had was was the handling he said they, they're they're cumbersome compared to a kayak or a canoe that they are cumbersome once they're inflated and you're in it and you're in the water they don't track as well they don't you know it's you know you got really mind. a surprise I mean, a, they're inflatable right that's yes they're inflatable um, so. but i thought the same thing martin was when I was living in northwestern Montana, I would have killed for one. I would have killed for one. I, I actually on my burrow packed two kayaks on my burrow way up in the back country to a lake that I, it had some of the most awesome cutthroat trout in that lake. But you couldn't get anything up there to go out on the lake in, you know, so you're shore fishing all the time. And a buddy of mine said, let's take a couple of kayaks up there. And I said, I'm not carrying a kayak up there. It's 11 miles. I'm not doing it. No. <laughs> he says, your donkey can carry him up. And I thought, well, yeah. Wise choice. Yeah, I, one of those little wheel were, things like, like Martin's but, got. The, but it was pretty funny when you're seeing two 12-foot kayaks going up the mountain on four legs, but you can't see what the animal is that's carrying them. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just a little goofy. With a couple of those um, 
pack rafts. So, man, you could drop those. If you're using pack animals, drop them in the pannier. You don't even know they're there. And if you're backpacking, the additional weight. I, I'm like you, Martin. I pack light. I pack light. I, well, speaking of light, like how realistically, how heavy are these pack gra pack rafts when once they're all folded yeah, about, up? About seven pounds. That includes um, wow. the uh, the um, like between five and seven. Like like, but the, some of them are made for two people, so they weigh a little more, right? right. But about seven pounds, I think, is about uh, average, and that includes what you need to inflate them, uh, and uh, you know, the, and they they can add things to them that can make them a little heavier and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Okay, but. But yeah, no, they are, and and the uh, the paddles they have these double bladed paddles um, that they sell. Um, that they're takedown paddles. They get down real small, so you can strap them to the outside of your pack, and they're not okay. going to be getting caught up when you're working through the bush. So it's not like a, a cheap, um, heavy, thick rubber rubber dinghy. It's made out of this kind of uh, material that, that that is more like uh, like it looks almost like cordura, but it's obviously not. It's something else, and it's kind of rubberized. So obviously, it holds right. air and it keeps water out. And, all that so yeah no they're they're impressive they're they're hard to puncture they're really hard to puncture and uh and yeah that was what they, i they was impressed with. yeah that's what i was i was impressed with how tough they were to puncture um because the folks that were demoing them up there were showing us um they had they had one that you could tell had been through the ringer and it had patches all over it <laughs> and he's stabbing it with a pole barn spike and hmm. it's bouncing right off of it. And he's giving her. And I said, well, for crying out loud, you're not going to whitewater with that thing. And People do. You, People and, do. And, and, that, and, and that's what he had said. I told, talk, I told him, I said, all you got to worry about is a really sharp stick, I guess. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. He says, don't worry about it. He says, the nice thing with these is they'll bounce off the rocks. He says, he says and you're not going to, a lot of times with r rubber rafts, You'll get rock burns on them that'll yeah. seep air. They just seep air, and you got to put a patch on them that's twelve inches around um, because they got a big rock burn on them. And um, I I took a raft trip on the Colorado years ago, and the raft I was in scared the hell heck out of me because it was just covered with patches. And they said, "Yeah, that's all rock burn patches," you know. Um, but yeah, these these pack rafts are tough. They're super tough. Yeah, so while we're on the topic of uh, of, of vessels of, of sort, what, what what do you have in your arsenal there, uh, Martin? Um, well, I've owned three canoes. Um, uh, my first canoe was a Novacraft, uh, sixteen foot uh, prospector. Uh, it was made out of uh, Royal Light, which is a lighter layup. I've got the exact boat here. Yeah, uh, I loved it, um, and I, uh, but it was too heavy, so I had to sell it. So a couple of years ago, I sold it, and I wanted to take some of that money and buy my little pack boat with it. Uh, but before I, I sold uh, that boat, I bought a Swift uh, Kippawa, um, 16 foot. Uh, that's a different boat. boat. Uh, so a Prospector is a symmetrical boat, uh, heavily rockered. Um, and that particular material that was made out of is, is made for bouncing off of rocks down rapids. So that was the perfect uh, boat for me uh, from the standpoint of a novice uh, canoe, which I was when I bought it. It was, you know, I, I was, it was like training wheels for me. I made every mistake. I, you know, banged it up real bad and stuff like that. Um, didn't affect its performance at all, but aesthetically it didn't look so great when I sold it. Um, but uh, everything on it was, uh, was otherwise in great condition, except the bottom looked pretty beat up. Uh, so that was my first boat, love that one. But then I needed something lighter. I'm getting older, I have a, a herniated disc, and I suffer from sciatica. Uh, so I needed a lighter boat. So uh, the boat that I have now is uh, a Kevlar boat uh, by Swift. It's uh, Ipawa, that's the tandem boat that my wife and I go tripping with. Uh, I can paddle it solo because it's not symmetrical like a uh, prospector is it's asymmetrical it's longer and pointer in front so it, it tracks a lot better um and my wife loves that boat because it's easier easy for her to stay on course paddling from the bow if i have to stop and do something fussing with a camera or fussing with some gear she can just keep on going but the prospector it would just veer off course it's impossible to steer from the bow but a boat that's longer and, and, and straighter 
uh, at, at, a, at the point of your bow, it, 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 it knifes through the water and tracks much straighter. So she loves that boat. And I love it because it's light. Now and then, you sacrifice maneuverability that with that though, right? Yeah, you would not want to, I wouldn't want to be in white water now because you, you can't side slip, right? So, I mean, it, it, it turns, but it's not, it's not as heavily rockered. Uh, yeah. That long uh, pointy front uh, acts uh, kind of like almost like a front rudder. So yeah. it just, it's, you, you can't veer suddenly and you can't side slip as easily. You can, but not as effortlessly as you could with Prospector. Uh, Prospector just, just it, it, you can move sideways in, in a current. You can, I mean, yeah. it's amazing the maneuvers you can do with, with that kind of rocker. Uh, hull. Uh, it's also got a harder chine. It's uh, the, that's the, the so the the bottom of the hull where it meets the sides. Uh, that that's called the chine, and the, the prospector uh, tends to have softer chine, so it has a very very good secondary stability. So it's a bit tippy when you get in, but once it goes over, it, you know she weebles and she wobbles, but she doesn't right. fall down. She, you, yeah, you, okay. can, you can paddle it heeled right over. Uh, my existing boat has a harder chine. Uh, once it gets over past a certain point, it, it, it's, it's a little tippier, so it's secondary stability is not as good. Uh, but that's, I mean, I'm skilled enough now that I'm not so concerned about tipping my boat. Okay. And then the last boat I bought was two summers ago. I bought a, a solo pack boat. Um, that's the 12 foot um, Swift pack boat. I just love it. Well, I wanted to, the reason I came on was because I wanted to ask you, and I don't, I kind of don't want to steal my own thunder here because um, I'd said to Dennis that, um, I kind of want to start doing something similar to what he's doing tonight, not like one-on-one -on -one interviews, but panel discussions. And mm -hmm. I kind of want to have you guys on for my canoe panel discussion when it kind of happens. So I don't want to ask all my questions yet, but I did want to ask, um, what made you buy a pack boat instead of another canoe? Um, so I, wanted to, I wanted to go solo. <laughs> I wanted to go solo. And when you are going solo and you're, um, and you're paddling with a, a, a single blade, it's a lot more work. It's a lot harder to paddle in wind and waves and current. Um, the advantage that kayakers have over canoeists is they have that double blade. Yeah. Uh, it is easier to track straight. You have you don't have to do as many corrective strokes and your paddle is in the water more of the time. Like as soon as one blade comes out, the other blade is going in. So basically- yeah. you're I have more cool. experience as a kayaker than, a, than as yeah. a canoeist, no, that's for there, sure. There's no handover, there's no handover. Right. With a kayak paddle, you don't have that handover when you want to switch sides. You're, yeah. You I never, almost never switch anyway. I almost never switch anyway. I almost always paddle on my right um, and do all my correction strokes from the right. I almost never right. paddle left. I'm not a good left left side paddler anyway. See, that's, that's me too. Lefty? Yeah. Uh-uh. No. Yeah. I, I, I paddle yeah, right. I'm a one-sider too. <laughs> no, so I was, I was it, it added, disappointed is when, I, when we went on our uh, big Nepikwasi trip this year that uh, – we have, usually we'll, we'll run into years where we're, we're trying to find a fourth, right? If we're if we got two two uh, two canoes going, we're always trying to find a fourth. Yeah, it's usually usually me that's trying to find a fourth, right? So I go, okay, you know what? I'm going to nip this in the bud. I'm going to pick myself up with a, a pack boat because I've always wanted to do the solo paddle. And then there's never an issue, right? We go on a trip, right. three of Don't us, or five of us, I'll gladly be the odd man out, right? Yeah. Well, you know yeah. what? I'll be darned. This year we end up with four guys. It's like. Can we find somebody else? We need one more person. <laughs> Same so problem. It's a pleasure to paddle. But if you have, like yourself, Jess, you want to get your daughter out there and stuff, you're going to need a tandem boat, obviously, to uh, to be able to get her out yeah. there and get her on the bow, right? So, yeah. yeah. So the, the pack boat really is for going solo, and it has another advantage, um, uh, and that is, I mean, when you have that double blade, it's it is easy to go in a straight line. So I can take yeah. any person who's never been in any kind of boat, put them in my boat, yeah. and they can go straight. Yeah. And they can make simple turns and stuff like that. If I say, here's a single blade, uh, go ahead, they're not going to be able to track straight because they don't know how to do the J-stroke. They don't know how to do prize and draws or anything like that. And you really don't need to do any of that when you've got a double blade. So it's it's a it's a kind of um, you know plug and play having that double blade, right? Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that's not to say that there's there's no great art to, to double bladed paddling uh, that kayakers do, for instance. But I mean, I don't have that skill yet. I'm still learning how to do, how to do that. I feel fairly proficient and, and confident with a single blade and a tandem boat, but uh, I'm still learning the art of the, the double blade. But I have to say, when I'm by myself in wind and waves, uh, that double blade is king. Man, I have no trouble tracking straight and, and 
staying on course and I can easily do braces. I'm less likely to tip because there's always one paddle in the water, that mm -hmm. one blade in the water that's acting like a rudder. So I love it for that reason. So when I'm by myself in that boat, I actually feel extremely safe. I don't feel as safe and um, as uh, in control in my tandem boat uh, with a with a single blade by myself. That's that's that's, that's more work. Is he so Kevin I, 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 chiming I, 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 in? Kevin yeah. in on this one. The double blade versus. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we'll talk I about would, that when you're a guest on the show, there, Kevin, for sure. I, I would um, wondered if Kevin was going to pipe in on the double blade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, T, Tina Tina is asking. Please discuss the length of the kayak paddle for your pack boat. I believe most people use too short of a paddle. I need a long paddle. I, I definitely need a one, uh, longer one with my prospect. I think I mine. What's mine? Uh, two eighty? Is that is that the right? Is that the right number? Yeah, mine's I think two twenty, two forty, something like that. It's fairly long. Um, but is, it, is it a different length than just in a straight up kayak? Yes. Yeah, because you yeah, you got to get over the right? You're you're right. over the metals, but you also have the reach. You got to get yeah. get it out there. So yeah. Otherwise, yeah, when you're in a kayak, yeah, in a kayak, you're trying yeah. to get that that you're trying to go vertical, right? Yeah. Right. You're, you're not right. Uh, because the more horizontal the, um, it is, right. The more when you, when you, when you, when you do your stroke, when you, when you, when you push on the left, pull on, uh, on the right, the boat's going to yaw this way. And when you do the opposite stroke, it's yeah. going to yaw that way. Right. And every time the boat yaws, okay. That's slowing your forward progress. Right. Mm -hmm. So you want that paddle blade to be as close to the hull as possible. Yeah. The problem is that when you're sitting in and, and that's okay, when you are sitting in a kayak and you're practically sitting below the water line, yeah. it's easy to get that paddle blade with that. But when you're in a in a pack boat, you're sitting a little bit higher and the, the, the boat is wider, right? The hull doesn't close in around you. It's yeah. wider. In fact, it flares a little bit. So to get that, that paddle blade into the water, it has to have a, a wider reach. And so when you're paddling a pack boat, it is not as efficient. It's much more efficient than a than just uh, paddling a, a, a comparable boat with a single blade. It's much easier to go straight um and and takes less effort but uh it's not quite as good as a kayak because a kayak is not going to yaw as much right but that longer blade in a pack boat means that you yaw more and so it's a slightly less efficient uh forward uh, motion see now sit on top uh, kayak uh, have the same issue though uh my 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 sit on kayak i have the same issue I, you know because i need a fairly i, I use a 90 inch paddle on a sit-on kayak, and a lot of people say, well, that's 10 inches too long for sure. And I said, well, I get some yaw from it, but after a while you start, it's, it's really in learning your positioning. You, you gotta know, you, you, you learn where you're not gonna bust your knuckles on the balance of the boat, you know? You, so you're, you're getting as much vertical as you possibly can with that longer paddle and you limit the yawing as much as possible. But yeah, with the longer paddle, you're going to get some. Um, like you said, if you're sitting in a regular sit-in kayak, your butt is below the water line. I mean, <laughs> your, your paddle's almost in the water before you even tip it. So, so I'm just reading Kevin's comments. Sorry, me too. Sorry. Yeah, me too. I won't laugh at you. <laughs> them, them fighting words for That's, Kevin. So here yeah, I, 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 I used to two blades. Eh? <laughs> I used to be of the Church of the Single Blade, and I thought, oh, the double blade, man, that's that's dark, nefarious stuff. Don't go there. Uh, but when I tried it uh, in that pack boat, I went, oh, wait a minute, there's something here. When paddling solo in this kind of boat, because I've tried. I mean, I, I have, I have four single blade paddles right, right right here behind me of various lengths and and, and, and and types and styles. And so when I take my little pack boat out with those, they, there's no way, like, you know, Kevin, you and I will have a race, right? <laughs> it's not I'll use my race. double blade. You use that any, any you it's use any speed. It's yeah. about, it's about the, the destination, right? Uh, yeah, no, no, but I mean, no, but it, no, but, but, but yeah. it's, it's not about speed. It's not about getting there sooner. It's yeah. you don't want to be exhausted. Like when you're crossing a big windy lake, it is exhausting. And when you get tired, that's when you can make a mistake and you can be a little late in responding and you can get caught uh, uh, at a bad angle by wave. And then you can be broadsided. And next thing you know, you're rolled and stuff like that. So when when I'm doing like I go out uh, on, um, on, on uh, a, a very, very big front country cottage lake here on a regular basis and uh, 
I like to go out when it's really windy and choppy, right? Uh, but I feel really comfortable with that double blade because it's easier to track straight. It's easy to make a corrective move. And with that one blade in the water all the time, it's like I'm in a constant brace. I feel really, really safe. I have not, I have not rolled it once and I have let myself get broadsided by some big waves just to see what would happen. It was so easy to brace and pop myself up. Um, so that's why I, I, I'm a convert to it, but only in my, in my solo boat. The rest of the time, I would never consider it. Yeah. I, I think you made the, canoe, yeah, the, the pack boat and the canoe are two very fundamentally different phenomena. Like, because to me, um, my attraction for the canoe is the history of it in, in this country, you know, how like the highways were rivers and stuff. And so to me, the, the idea of canoeing, like, it's the same as, you know, my favorite fire starting method is flint and steel, because I love that when I go snap, it, I'm doing something that is time honored. And so I think that, it, you know, for me, if I was to buy a pack boat, it wouldn't be for the same context as a canoe. Because, well, you know, like a, a pack, because as I, as I told you, like I'm, I'm comfortable with, with a kayak paddle and everything, mm -hmm. um, but I like sort of the, oh God, I don't want to get all purple prosy on you guys but i like the poetry of of the old school canoe you know i, I don't mean I, it needs to be like birch bark I, I mean you know the the form of it you know the <clears throat> the trail of history from the voyageur to to me thanks Daniel. Canoe, you know um but what i like about the pack boats seems to be that they, i don't want to say they seem a little sportier but they seem a little more like obviously it's a more modern boat you know it's a more modern design uh, and it, it seems like they've fixed some uh, of the issues with the canoe and some of the issues with the old school kayak you have to sort of think of it uh, as, as this soloing a very traditional uh, style of canoe with single blade is a lot harder than than tandem help it poses other challenges you, you need more skill it can be a lot a lot more tired out. Right. Uh, just, 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 yeah. Um, with the double blade, you sort of eliminate that, that problem. It's also easier to learn. Like, so if you, I, you, know, you, you know, never got I, code, I but, hate but, to admit it, but double blade for me, that's, I, I'm sorry, guys, but that's an old man's battle. Well, no, that's I, true. That's true, I, actually. If you I, get uh, joint pain, if you have I, joint yeah, pain, yeah, I, can, stuff like I, can, that. I can single paddle. I can single paddle, but oh, man. I want to enjoy my trip, and I can't. I'll, single paddle in a canoe burns me out anymore. It just burns me out in a fraction of the amount of time than what a double paddle will. So, so I, you know, for the romance of, I'm good. I, I'm going to do it old school. Oh, the heck! I'm not romantic anymore. I just want to be comfortable. <laughs> Actually, yeah, because yeah, uh, 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 retired outside, it is it possible to use a single blade in a pack boat, but you need a really sharp paddle? Yeah, it, it, it is possible to use one. And actually, Swift is actually, um, they uh, sort of nipped that one in the bud, right? My particular pack boat has a established seat in the bottom, like a kayak seat. But they do also offer an option where they've got a two-level seat where it snaps out of the lower position and up into the higher position. Yeah, I you saw can that. You do both either uh, kayak paddle or using a single blade. Single. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. I, I had a bad I'm idea. Thinking I should have gone that option, so I had that option because it's a lot yeah. harder to run a pack boat through rapids, say, for instance, with kayak paddle than it would be with a single blade. Oh, yeah, okay. I hadn't even thought right. of that. Yeah, have you had experience with running whitewater with uh with the double blade in the pack boat, uh, Martin? No, not at all, not yet. Um, I I hope to, but you see the problem with that is that um, whereas I, I have some confidence with a single blade in in uh, in moving water, um, I have no practice uh, with the double blade in moving water, and that's it's a completely different skill set which I don't have yet. As I said, I'm I'm new to this. I was from the church of the single blade my you know uh, my entire paddling career until I. I bought this boat two summers ago, and so now I, I'm, I'm used to in calm water, uh, well, calm in flat water, as opposed to moving water, right? Like lake water, um, uh, wind and waves is fine, uh, but um, 
when the current is pushing you around and there's obstacles and stuff like that, and you try to navigate. I don't know the techniques. I just don't know how to make that boat go where I need it to go uh, reliably. Uh, so, I mean, if you said, uh, here you go. Hey, Jen. Hey. Um, Actually, we got two new ones. So hopefully you guys weren't waiting down there. You were below my thing. I couldn't see you guys. <laughs> I <was laughs> sitting in the uh, Windsor for such a long time. Hey, have uh, outdoors you guys here. Nice to meet you. Hey, nice and, you, uh, we have Ethan over here from Avid Outdoorsy Guy, the guy who's just jumped like a thousand subscribers overnight. No, that's right. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. all yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome on uh, hitting over a thousand. That's that's great. Happy for you, man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. Great. Yeah, I, uh, I jumped. I think I'm up to almost two thousand now, and just uh, just like a week. Like no, okay, you're off the panel. No, <laughs> that's awesome. Man. Congratulations! That's the kind of stuff I like hearing about. I like that. That's good, man. Congratulations! That's you awesome. deserve it. Your stuff's good. Hey. Uh, Martin, I was going to ask you, how long do you think it'll take for you to become proficient at the the double paddle? Then, oh, for you've, had, you've had it for a couple of of, of summers, and, and you've said a couple of times that you still feel like um, a beginner at that style of a uh, of boating like how how long do you think it'll take you to become i mean you've you've been single paddling for many years so maybe not as proficient as you are at, at the single but how long do you think it'll take for you to become comfortable oh well i'm perfectly comfortable in in uh in wind and waves and, and quiet water conditions but but moving water is a completely different animal i mean if you know how to paddle on 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 lakes and you know the creeks and you know, things like that that's great you can be excellent at doing that but when you get into moving water you'll discover that that it's a different the j, the j stroke the goon stroke simple prize and draws are not going to do it you, you, it's a completely different thing you, you should take a course for that and so if i wanted to just throw myself into moving water in my pack boat with a blade that I have never used in those kinds of, of conditions, I, I would I would first start by watching a ton of YouTube videos on the subject, which I have not done because I've only been paddling in uh, in, in lakes and stuff like that, not in current. Right. Uh, and then I you know I'd pick up a book on kayaking, and I you know and the thing is a pack boat is not quite a kayak. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't know that there's that 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 it's quite cross-platform learning is going to work that way, that uh, whatever a kayaker would tell me to do is going to work with my pack boat. Honestly, I don't know. So I can't answer that question. I, uh, you know, See, I, actually, I'd be making it up if I did. You, you made the perfect statement there. A pack boat is not a kayak, and a mm -hmm. pack boat is not a canoe. Yeah. A pack boat is a pack boat. Yeah, it's a hybrid. Right? Exactly. Hybrid. So, like, you know, it's, it's like saying a paddle board is a sit-upon kayak. No, it's not. No, it's no. a totally <laughs> different vessel, right? So, it has its own thing. I mean, when yeah. I got into doing some whitewater stuff, I mean, a lot of the Bill Mason videos on YouTube, the old school <laughs> canoeing videos are pretty awesome there. You know, they so. are. They are. They, they yeah. can make those things dance, right? Yeah. 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 Make it look so easy, right? <laughs> oh, he sure makes it easy. I mean, the first time I got onto moving the water, I, I had I had been paddling for a while now on, on, on quiet water, flat water, and I I quite confident that I could handle uh, moving water and so one spring it was late spring too the water wasn't running that fast um we were where were we on were we on big creek i can't remember uh but anyway we were just getting blown around <laughs> i had no idea how to make that boat go where i wanted to go we were just it, it was just taking us to the outside of the bends all the time and i just and i knew what i needed to do i knew what i needed to do i'd watched the videos i'd read um uh the uh, uh uh, Joni and Gary McGuffin's um, um, a, a book on the subject. I'd read Bill Mason's book on the subject. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I'd watch as many videos as I, I, I could find. So I knew, in theory, what I needed to do, but I couldn't get my body to do it right and quickly or in time. <laughs> and, and you have to know the movement. It's got to be automatic, right? It's got to be just reflexive. You can't be thinking about how to do it. You've got to do it quickly and efficiently, and you have to do it in time. That is, you have to go... Oh, I see that yeah, there. I need there. to start doing it now. It's not enough to go. Oh, I should be doing this now. So that you're no longer in that part of the river, right? And you're, you know, you know, and you're up against a, a strainer or a sweeper or something like that, or worse. Yeah, you got to read the water ahead. You know, you got to be thinking like two or three steps ahead of what's going on. So it's essentially yeah. mountain biking on water, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. And the yeah. whole experience the is fluid. It's changing by the second, not by the minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I just looked at the time. Okay, guys, I got to go.
All right. Dennis knows why I got to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll talk to you in a bit there. Uh, right. I, I, I'll probably pop yep. on later on when I get back from uh, chicken wing night here tonight. Sure but, thing. Uh, um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do to send people over, man. See you later. Thanks, yeah. guys. Later. Yeah. yeah. So we uh, with uh, some of your your new face, Jen. Uh, like I said, nice to meet you. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Your channel. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm uh, the Wild Yam. I think I started my channel up about four years ago or so. Uh, and really just to showcase what I get up to. I, you know, go on my bush adventures and go in the cabin. And, um, you know, my, my friends were like, oh, what did you do? What did you do? And so it was great to kind of show everybody, including my family who lives quite far away, as to what I get up to. And you know, it changed sort of from, you know, just showing other people what I like to do to just an educational focus as well. Because I realized people spend a lot of time outdoors, but they may not know, you know, what they're looking at in terms of, um, wild edibles or, you know, reading weather patterns or uh, uh, and things like that. So, um, you know, I just started getting into that with the channel and, uh, you know, I got into sort of this kind of wilderness stuff a bit later in life. You know, I've always had a love for nature, but sort of in my mid twenties and thirties really kind of picked up with the outdoors living. <laughs> hmm. yeah. Jen's oh. channel is one of the most variegated in terms of content of, mm -hmm. of all the, 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 the channels that I'm subscribed to that have to do with camping and canoeing and bushcraft and all that stuff. And, and uh, I don't know of anybody whose channel is sort of more spread out over uh, all kinds of things. And, and Jen, Jen is someone who sort of, I can tell, I mean, I don't, I don't know Jen that well. Uh, <laughs> so I'm talking about it like she's no old friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know. But I mean, uh, I've been watching her channel for a long time and she immerses herself in a subject. It's very obvious and, and, and gets her hands dirty and, and she just learns a subject uh, quite thoroughly. And then she, she imparts what she knows. So I have, I have learned a ton from her channel since she started. And uh, yeah, so I'm happy to recommend it to anybody. It's, it's terrific. It covers so much, everything from, from trail uh, cams to basically homesteading, uh, an off-grid uh, cabin, camping, canoeing, fishing, you name it. it she, she, she just covers the whole range, the whole gamut. Yeah. So that. like my husband and I, we built a 10 by 24 cabin in the woods on a property that we bought a few years ago and I mean that was a really good growth experience for myself you know like I never built anything in my life like that so uh it's it's a real accomplishment I think for me to do that and just see what what you know we as women outdoorsmen can do um so I just like to also sh you know bring in like kids and women to the outdoors world as well just to say you know we can do all kinds of cool stuff out there and and, and like Martin said I like to um learn myself and what I learn I like to spread on to other people so so you'll you you you'll probably really love our uh, guest that we're going to have on uh, November fifth. Uh, we're chatting with her mother a little while ago. There, uh, yeah. uh, Billy, uh, the bushcraft daughter is going to be on the show. I'll be interviewing her November the fifth. And I don't know if you're familiar with her channel, but she's a young lady, fourteen years old, and she's into all the bushcrafting and stuff. And she's uh, from um, New Zealand, and. She, I, I've been following her forever on, well, not forever, but for quite a long time on Instagram, and she's really an inspirational young lady. So, oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, yeah. check that out. Yeah, for sure. And how about yourself, Ethan? What have you been up to, man? I know uh, you're you're really uh, you got yourself a good boost for sure. And uh, what do you, what do you got going on for the winter time? Anything exciting? Uh, yeah, I actually have a few things in the works. Um, I don't know when stuff is going to be going down, but I, I got to do a little winter camping around here. Uh, probably winter camping with Joe at least once. Um, and then I think there's going to be some sort of big YouTuber get together in the pipes somewhere in February that I'm going to be going to. So that should be pretty cool. Uh, meet up with a bunch of big YouTuber outdoors YouTubers that I've, I've always been watching and wanted to meet. So that, that'll be pretty cool. Hmm. Very good. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty excited. And where's that going to be? Um, I don't exactly know. I, I don't know the, any details yet. It, it's, uh, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't, I, I don't really know anything. I, I just know vague details and, Make sure I, I, really I get the invitation, though, <laughs> Huh? Make sure I get my invitation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I received an invitation from the man himself, who's in, who's organizing it. So, 
I, I don't have the power to spread anymore. <laughs> you know what? One thing I, that kind of slipped my mind was, um, and Tom, you're you're familiar, or sorry, Tom, uh, Martin, you're familiar with Tom. Uh, I believe you you and him been talking about uh, tickets for the winter camping symposium coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He actually gave me one of his tickets, and it was uh, oh, pretenses that I can give it away to somebody, obviously somebody local that can make it in Ontario. Uh, we've got the Winter Camping Symposium coming up. Do you know the date? Uh, it is November 23rd. It's a November. Saturday. It's an all-day event. Like it, Well, I mean, from like 9 to 4. Um, yeah. And it's at the University of Waterloo in the Theater of the Arts. It's a, it's a symposium, so it's just a, a bunch of talks, a bunch of people uh, who love uh, camping, specifically winter camping, either because they have experience in it uh, and want to learn more or they're brand new to it and they want to give it a try. Uh, there's tons of vendors there and there's a lineup of five speakers. Um, and uh, I, I was there for the, uh, uh, the first two and they were fantastic. So, Hi, Aaron. So, hey, so I guess the point I'm trying to get at there, and uh, yes, I have one ticket. I'm going to the event myself. Uh, hopefully, well, well, we'll actually hook up there most likely, uh, Martin. And uh, yeah, I'll right? be there. But yeah, uh, if somebody there. on the stream is from Ontario, Canada, or if you want to travel all the way from, you know, <laughs> have an outdoorsy guy land or something, right? I, ha I have one ticket to the uh, Winter Camping Symposium that uh, I would gladly give to somebody because it was donated to me. Um, I'll put my email address on the screen on the bottom, and if uh, if more than one person requests it, what I'll do is I'll just do a little draw there again on my honesty, and I'll give it to somebody because uh, it was given to me to sort of as a giveaway here on the, uh, the live stream. So I'll put my if people on the bottom row. Sorry, I'm just going to put a banner up with my email address so uh, people can uh, check that out. But if somebody wants the ticket, please do. Send me an email and give me your details, and I'll shoot you over the e-ticket. So, yeah. I don't know, Dennis. I don't know if you noticed in the chat much earlier, uh, but um, Kevin's going to be at a at a winter camping camping symposium this weekend. Yeah, within an hour of my house. Well, there you go, man. Oh, cool. so, I, so, so, so Kevin and I are going to try to work it out, and we're going to maybe do a whiskey around the campfire while he's up here so yeah. you're uh, in, how are you tonight buddy or this morning in your case well i just well i just woke up so <laughs> <laughs> good morning good morning he's like on the other side of the world for the, you people in the chat that uh, are unfamiliar with him but uh our last chance at my email i'm just going to pull it down in a second here my time here is 2 56 a.m oh, oh yeah. boy <laughs> He needs a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I need to eat my finish my oatmeal first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Simon, thanks Dennis. for coming to the street tonight. We'll uh, probably see you in a little while. Yeah, so uh, we're actually getting ready to wind down ourselves, guys. Uh, it's at eight fifty-six. Um, I just wanted to uh, to say thank you to everybody, especially you, Martin. Uh, this has been an awesome official first live uh, interview stream. I think uh, I think this whole concept is going to work for me, and uh, I, I really appreciate everybody in the live stream and in the chat. Uh, new guests, new faces, Jen. Uh, that's always awesome to, to see new people in. I'll definitely be checking out your channel. The, the one thing I could already see what's going to happen here. I got a lot of YouTube watching to do yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> because you know what? There's so many new people coming in. I'll definitely be going back to the stream myself to see what I might've missed. Cause it's hard to keep track of chat conversation and two computers. Yeah. And for the record, uh, for those of you that seen uh, Cheryl Rogers on the screen, that's actually my wife, but mm. she's not on, I'm using her computer down here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I've been piping in the conversation as her. Uh, so for those of you that think somebody's uh, snuggling up to you, it's not my wife, it's me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, with that being said, I just want to go over a couple of quick announcements before it is closing time, and uh, we'll get a few uh, closing statements from everybody here. Uh, next week, I don't actually have any guests lined up, so we'll probably just open it up to a general conversation forum. 
But uh, in the future, what I do have lined up already, I have uh, the Bushcraft Daughter. Millie is going to be on on November the 5th. Uh, Royalty on Water himself, Mr. Kevin Callan, will be uh, joining me on November the 12th for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Great. And then I've actually got a couple of other really interesting guests that uh, you may or may not know about uh, that we're talking to um, that uh, that we're hoping to get on the uh, on the panel here. So uh, I've actually got people approaching me. But if anybody is interested uh, in being you know interviewed one on one uh, to help build your channels and uh, you know to get yourself better known out there, I. I haven't got the hugest YouTube channel, but things are starting to grow for me as well. And it's a great opportunity for us all to uh, network in kind of a different way and to grow our channels as small creators as well, right? So if anybody's interested, I've dropped my email on there. I will put it in the link uh, or in the description below so you can actually check that out. I'm always open to conversation or uh, any suggestions and things like that. That's not me honking a horn. I don't. <laughs> that was me. Sorry, I'm on my phone. <laughs> Too many beans for dinner tonight, Ethan. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, like I say, this is uh, this is really something for me that I'm honored to have all of you on the uh, the live stream tonight. Uh, I, I've gotten already many many compliments on this type of format. And I've already got people saying that they're willing to, or going to try and mimic this. Format. <laughs> It's not something I'm trying to mimic myself, but it's it's just a growth thing for me, uh, for my my channel, and it gives me the opportunity to get to new know, to go. get to know new people and to get to know them, right? So, Ethan, thanks for coming out. Uh, be sure to subscribe uh, to uh, Martin's channel for those of you that uh, may not already be subscribed. He's got some great content on there. You want to make sure uh, you check that all out. And uh, you are going to learn something, and you're going to be entertained for sure. Too bad we couldn't get your wife on panel tonight. Uh, but you know what? She's got some great uh, dehydrating recipes there, which I've already started on. So that's cool stuff. Uh, don't, uh, don't forget to subscribe to Canoe Hound Adventures. Uh, hit that bell notification. We go live every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. And uh, we're going to just try and make this whole show much, much, much better. So... Anybody got any closing statements? Martin, yourself? Uh, well, I'd like to thank you uh, very much for inviting me. I had a, I knew I would have a lot of fun, and this was exactly what I thought it would be. Just you know, a bunch of people with a, of like mind and, and, and similar passions talking about what they, they love. So that, that was great. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who sort of came over that I um, sort of notified about this and everyone who's already watching this, uh, this channel and these live streams. Thank you for, for sticking around participating in the chat. I really enjoyed it. I, I, I wish I could have responded to more questions in the live chat, but uh, because I was in the hot seat, I had, I had to do a lot of talking. And I, I can't talk and read at the same time, so I apologize uh, for that. But if you do have questions for me that uh, went unanswered or something like that, feel free to ha head over to uh, my channel and um, just post a comment uh, under some video or something like that. It doesn't have to be relevant to the, the video or anything. It just that's a pretext to, to Fire a question my way, but anyway, I appreciate everyone's participation. Oh, and I have to say a, 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 a special hello and a thank you to uh, Nate Muskoka, who was uh, in the live chat. He's a he's a friend of mine um, and someone I've uh, started going out uh, paddling with. We're planning a, uh, a a trip at some point, maybe one last canoe trip of the season, and hopefully a, a hot tenting winter camping trip later this winter. So, hi Nate, thanks for stopping and really appreciate it. So well, thank you, everyone. I really enjoyed this. this was yeah, Martin, I'm hoping that uh, we'll, we'll obviously be meet, or meeting at the uh, Winter Symposium there. Yep. And, uh, yeah, maybe sit down over a coffee, maybe hash out a, a plan for either a weekend or, you know, a four-day trip or something. That would be uh, that would be pretty cool. I, I maybe you're going to convince mine to come along, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. Yeah, actually. that would be incredible for sure. What, um, one other thing, well, just one other thing. If, if anybody uh, who's watching this or who will watch this is, is going to be attending the uh, Ontario Winter Camping Symposium in November, I, as I said, I'm, I'm going to be there. So if you are there, uh, please don't be shy. Just come up and introduce yourself, okay? Uh, I really love meeting other people who are in the community who are uh, online and it's always terrific to meet people who are familiar with my content and stuff like that. So I, yeah, it's instant friends when that happens. Martin, you think it'd be tacky to wear my Canoe Hound Adventure shirt to the symposium? No, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I, don't have any, I don't have any merch or anything like that, but I'd wear it if I had any. <laughs> yeah, for sure. 
Sly, how about yourself? Any, anything to close with? Well, I just want, I, I appreciate that you brought me up on the panel. I, I'll tell you what, Martin, I love visiting with you and Kevin and Dennis. Great conversations. I love hearing about Crown properties. I mean, you know, I, I talked to Dennis about the comparison between the U.S. forest and BLM properties versus the Canadian um, Crown properties. And yeah, there, there's there's a lot of similarities and there's a lot of differences. And um, But great topics. I, I mean, you couldn't have picked a better guest there, Dennis. Um, and I think this, I think this format is going to go a long ways. It's going to go a long ways um, because you're bringing a lot of different interests up front, where people will go, "Oh boy, I, I got a question related to that." You know, a lot of people think most people are narrow-minded. They only have one, you know, I only, I only enjoy one thing in life. Well, that's really not true. We're interested in a lot of things. And that's why I, the wild yam channel, <laughs> go check it out. Dennis is right. It's all over the board. It's got so <laughs> much. If you can't find something that you're going to like in there, then you're not looking hard enough. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there, she's got so much content in there. It's wonderful. So, so other other than that, I'm done. There's awesome. Mike. And yourself, uh, Jen, thanks for popping in. And hopefully uh, you'll be back again. But I will be definitely checking out your stuff as well. So, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. I'm so excited to discover this channel through Pine Martin. And uh, I'm looking forward to meeting all of you really well. I think there's a wealth of knowledge here. And uh, like, you know, like Martin and Steinor said, you know, just there's so much, you know, camaraderie that we have we just all love similar things but we all have different things and perspectives to share so i think this is me super cool to be involved with your channel and just congrats on how well it's been doing i can see why it's doing well you know this kind of format this is this is great yeah and how about yourself there yara well i haven't been on since the beginning of the stream so i woke up pretty late <laughs> so uh, <laughs> Leave for you, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'm gonna tell you, Dennis. I got your mail yesterday. Oh, all right. Oh. Good for you, man. Oh. Yeah, it came yesterday. So yeah, your your has been a long time supporter of the channel. He, uh, him, and I've uh, struck up a pretty good friendship here on YouTube. And uh, did you have you opened it? Yeah, I opened it yesterday. Okay, okay. Guess what he got, Stein? I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> he got a few out stickers, so that's awesome. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, I was going to put mine on my truck today, and I went out there. Literally, between the door and my truck, it started raining. Oh, I was oh. mad. I was <laughs> mad. Yeah. And I had the stickers in my hand. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, anyway, so I appreciate that. Uh, my wife has just sent me a text there. We're getting ready to go out for chicken wings. She's out. Uh, she's a <laughs> sportsman in the family. She's a bowler. <laughs> so we're, we're going out for pizza and wings, and I'm going to head there. Uh, Jess from Rain Dance Bushcraft, the uh, reason why he had the duck out is because he's actually just starting his live stream that starts at 9 o'clock. That's uh, Rain Dance Bushcraft. If anybody's interested in going over and doing a uh, Canoe Hound Adventures raid, feel free to do so. <laughs> uh, maybe Dave can throw that on the uh, in the chat there if Dave is still online. Uh, Dave, thanks for being a great moderator tonight. That's Dave from Beastly Ironworks. And everybody, I just want to say to you all, thanks again. And remember, keep the adventures alive. Hey, Have a good great night, everybody. everybody. Peace. Take care, Cheers. everybody. Cheers. <laughs> Bye. Good to see you again, Stai. Have a good night. Good night. <laughs>